Let me thank all the participants for your numerous participation, guest lecturers for your willingness to share your experiences with us, and my colleagues who helped prepare this conference. In the LIFE Climate Path 2050 project, the Josef Stefan Institute Energy Efficiency Center is coordinating a consortium consisting of the following sectoral experts. ELEC consultants for the power sector, the Building and Civil Institute, ZRMK, Institute for Economic Research, the Agricultural Institute of Slovenia, PNZ consultants for transport, and the Slovenian Forestry Institute. This conference is also co-organized by Climate Recon 2050 project, financed by European Climate Initiative of the German Ministry of the Environment and the European Climate Foundation. As you can see, the conference is due to current situation with COVID organized in hybrid form. However, we are enthusiastic to welcome over 300 participants to the conference from over 25 countries all over the world. For those guests who joined us online, there are some technical information on the right side of the screen in the chat section. Please check the instructions because they will be also changing during the conference. You're welcome to actively participate at the conference by providing your feedback on your work on long-term energy and climate strategies and implementation process, making questions to our guest lecturers or discuss with other experts about your experiences and your challenges. We're looking forward to your contribution to the conference. And now I would like to ask the welcome uh, speakers for their welcome address. I would like to invite first the director of Josef Stefan Institute, Professor Dr. Bustian Zalar. <coughs> Dear participants, live and remotely, as a director of Josef Stefan Institute, the largest Slovenian research institution, it is my privilege to welcome you at uh, you to Live Climate Path 2050 conference on designing pathways to carbon neutrality. High number of participants to the conference show us the importance of discussions on scientific approach and support to decision-making process to achieve European short and long-term climate goals. These days we experience in different areas how important it is that the expert knowledge is embedded in decision-making and also that expert, experts need to promptly respond to the challenges of the society and also to be able to deal with uncertainties we are facing with. The main objective of the LIFE Climate Path 2050 project is to improve decision support analysis and to stimulate use of analytical basis for decision making. Similar are the objectives, objectives of this conference to contribute to the expert knowledge to exchange experiences. We have a common goal of implementing the Paris Agreement but we have also in common many challenges related to the implementation and tasks behind and in front of us. All the EU member states have, com have completed processes of preparing long-term strategies and national energy and climate plans. There are specific situations and problems in different countries, but there are also a lot of issues we can share and many challenges ahead of us. We believe that sharing experiences and vision can contribute substantially to make our efforts fruitful. 300 participants registered from more than 25 countries shows great interest. We are glad that many prominent speakers and participants are between us today. Josef Stefan Institute has a long tradition in modeling to support energy and climate strategic planning and implementation. 
It is the leading research institution in Slovenia, and we have an established cooperation with national and international partners. We hope that this conference will possibly result in new projects and collaborations. I wish you a fruitful and inspiring work at the conference, leading towards successful design of climate neutral pathways, which will be effectively implemented in our society. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I would like to ask Dr. Martin Batic from the Ministry of Environment and Spatial Planning for his introductory speech. Thank you. Uh, dear guests, dear conference participants, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Ministry of the Environment and Spatial Planning, I warmly welcome all participants to this important international conference entitled entitled uh, <coughs> Designing Pathways Toward Climate Neutrality. I also congratulate the Energy Efficiency Center of the Josef Stefan Institute and the Consortium of Partners of the Life Climate Path 2050 for organizing an event at a challenging time of climate change and at a time when viruses and in particular the SARS-CoV-2 virus are drastically affecting our way of life, which is also affected in greenhouse gas emissions. Our planet is facing challenges ranging from the aforementioned COVID pandemics to the environment and climate, which also threaten our way well-being if we do not adapt while drastically reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In order to establish a sustainable way of life in the long term, we need to approach the possible solutions holistically, looking at many factors such as the environment, climate, economy, and society as in separable parts of the world. Therefore, creating an optimal path to climate neutrality is a necessity and a challenge of today. This conference is therefore an opportunity to bring together experts in their efforts to achieve the objectives of the Paris agreement, agreement in one very specific area, assessing and designing the pathway to climate neutrality. Most importantly, the conference is also an opportunity to find synergies and other forms of cooperation, knowledge transfer and successful practices. This year, the National Assembly set the important goal of achieving climate neutrality by 2050 by adopting the resolution of on Slovenia's long-term climate strategy until 2050. On the way to the elaboration of the long-term climate strategy, the LIFE project, Climate Path 2050, has also made an important contribution by providing the technical basis for the elaboration of this strategy, as well as for the elaboration of the National Energy Climate Plan. Even more, this project also makes an important contribution to the monitoring of the existing operational program for the reduction of greenhouse gases in Slovenia. LIFE is the EU financial instrument for supporting projects in the fields of the environment, nature conservation and climate change through the EU. For Slovenia, the, adoption, the approval of climate, uh, LIFE Climate Path 2050 by European Commission and confidence by our ministry, Ministry of the Environment and Spatial Planning, has proven to be very useful as it contains the important elements for monitoring progress and planning further climate action to reduce greenhouse gases in different sectors. Most importantly, the project builds on the development and improvement of the existing system for climate pro projection and monitoring of climate action. In conclusion, I wish you a fruitful and inspiring work at the conference with many original ideas for designing pathways toward climate neutrality for effective and efficient implementation in society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Batic. And now I would ask uh, 
Mr. Primoz Simončić, Director of the Slovenian Forestry Institute, for his welcome address. The Forestry Institute is also hosting today's conference. Yeah, I wish you a warm welcome at our institute for uh, today and the next uh, two days. So uh, I also, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, to have th this kind of events, final conferences at in our house. And uh, especially this team uh, was, uh, uh, we are working together maybe 20 years. And uh, it's not from yesterday, but it's, uh, it's, always, uh, it's already from many years ago when we started with Kyoto Protocol and uh, the first task at that time. And now we are facing uh, to the pathway towards climate neutrality. At that time, we didn't think about that, but today it's uh, this uh, really uh, nice and, uh, event. And uh, what I see, it's uh, really, uh, the, the, the speakers will be very interesting. Uh, the, I hope that we will get uh, a lot of knowledge about the uh, problematic, especially because we are facing, for example, to COP26 uh, next month in uh, Glasgow, and we will also talk uh, there about uh, some of uh, topics uh, which, are, uh, which were elaborated during the project. So we are also facing to uh, new EU policy, Green Deal and FIT 55, which a uh, uh, li little bit change EU policy regarding our topic. So, and uh, of course, together with Green Deal and uh, Paris Agreement, uh, there are really a lot of open questions, uh, what and how we should do in our very uh, near future regarding uh, the uh, green gas uh, gases emissions. So maybe uh, you are asking why forests, why, why we are also uh, part of the, this project, which is very nice, uh, was uh, from, from the, uh, Dr. Batic, from the Minister of Environment, yeah, life projects are really covering uh, this kind of problematic. Forests are um, covering uh, around 60% of Slovenia. And uh, if we look like atmosphere C, not like the, um, the policy C, uh, we see that uh, one third of the emissions of the uh, CO2 uh, emissions are uh, uh, then uh, the forest is sink for this one third of emissions in Slovenia. And it is for, for many years so. Uh, but uh, we are facing with the policy which uh, see uh, and produce some rules like IPCC or EU uh, uh, legislation. Another view, another uh, component of the lowering uh, uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. So, yeah, uh, we calculate this in different way. So, uh, and, uh, so we are facing, uh, and we will hear also at this conference some different ideas, different approaches about that, the last day on Friday. So, and I'm really, uh, I'm, it's really interesting to hear what, what, what will be, uh, what speakers will uh, tell us. So, if I finish, uh, I uh, thank the organizers, to uh, Institute Jose Stefan, and uh, they were really uh, nice leading uh, partner, so uh, thank you, and the whole team. And uh, I wish all participants nice staying at our institute. Thank you for the introductions. And now let me introduce you briefly to the conference program. Uh, we have a three days conference. The first day is dedicated to two sessions. Uh, the first session will be how ambitious are the long-term climate strategies, and the session two in the afternoon is the monitoring and evaluation for better implementation. Uh, as you know, uh, there is a separate link for the second day program. Uh, I would invite you also to join us uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. We will deal with challenges of carbon neutral pathways modeling and analysis uh, tomorrow with the roundtable discussion also on the decarbonization of industry. And Friday program will be devoted to Lulu CF sector and with the uh, Forestry Institute who will be leading the final day. Uh, now without further hesitation, I would like uh, to uh, go to the conference program. 
However, prior to that, uh, we would like to warm up uh, the participants uh, which joined us online and also participants uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, room. We would like to uh, introduce a couple of feedback questions to you using Mentimeter. And you can see that we have uh, the first Mentimeter already prepared. I would like to ask you to check your uh, chat section on the right hand of the screen for the questions uh, which will emerge and uh, I will be leading you through these questions. Uh, you need to either go to menti.com and uh, enter the code or you can click to the link. Uh, whoever has a mobile phone, you can use smartphones also to access to Menti meter. And by now the first question we would like to ask you is what are your associations with the title of the conference, Pathways to Climate Neutral Neutrality. Please provide a word or a combination of words and uh, we will see your answers on the screen based on the number of the answers. And we'll wait for a couple of seconds to get your entries. You can click either on the right hand of the chat section or you can go to menti.com and use the code 75279334. You can see there are different words and different level. Oh. Do you have do you have the screen on on the on on Zoom? We have some technical problems uh, apparently uh, Participants online cannot see the screen. We have various answers. Uh, the largest one is ambition. It's transport, renewables, work-related, decarbonization, vision goals measures make life possible sustainability reducing energy consumption pollution reduction economy decarbonization absolutely necessary policy does not follow lots of uncertainties environment make life possible cooperation so we see many different questions and uh, many different answers. So the next question we would like to ask is what is the main reason you joined this conference? You have several options and you can also select several options and based on your answers we'll see the number of answers to, to each of the options. So far, getting new knowledge and information is the first answer. Then we have equal, I was involved in national strategic, strategic documents like national energy climate plans. I'm involved in modeling and projections. We would like to see good practice exchange. Uh, somehow the, the, the answers we expected, uh, we're glad to, to see that uh, you all are looking for new knowledge and information about the strategy, about models, and uh, this is uh, what the conference is all about. 
And uh, thank you for the answers. We will continue with this exercise also during the round tables. Uh, so maybe just be prepared uh, to uh, give us your feedback uh, again. And now let me start with the conference. In the first section, session we have the title How Ambitious are the Long-Term Climate Strategy. We have divided the presentations into two sections. The first one is uh, dedicated to key speakers and we have three key speakers and I would like to invite the first key speaker Mr. Dejan Paravan from Gen E, the energy company in Slovenia. Uh, Dejan Paravan is one of the leading experts in Slovenia, energy experts. He's a chief innovation officer at Gen E, one of the fastest growing and most innovative companies in the European energy market. The company which entered, entered the Slovenian market as the first independent supplier of electricity and natural gas, today focuses on green transformation, reducing carbon footprint, and ensuring a clean environment for future generations. Mr. Paravan titled his speech with long-term vision in practice. Mr. Paravan, the floor is yours. Uh, from my side to everybody. Uh, so, so my presentation will be around uh, how Gen I uh, uh, it's um, it's uh, on the way towards uh, sustainability. Um, as far as the biggest global challenge of our time, uh, I think that nowadays uh, this challenge is very clear. So uh, in uh, nowadays, we, we believe that uh, it's quite clear that global warming is the problem or the challenge that we really need to focus on uh, in order to uh, survive and in order to um, keep our planet safe. Uh, and as a result, it is also very clear that we need to uh, diminish or to become uh, greenhouse gas emission neutral by 2050. So also the goal, it's quite and very clear. Uh, today, uh, at least in Slovenia, energy is responsible roughly for one quarter of all emissions. So it's a big chunk of current gas emissions. And we made and posed uh, a goal, a challenge that uh, we shall and we can, as you will see, decarbonize uh, our power sector while maintaining reliable uh, uh, supply by 2040. Uh, so what is the role of business and economy in this green transformation? And also what role Genai plays in uh, all of it? So our belief is uh, as first that business leaders uh, have all the gears, all the tools, and a need to lead the way and to show how to achieve this. Uh, it's a matter of choice. Yeah? We, we can wait and um, make the regulation uh, uh, change our way of doing, or we can be ahead of all those trends and make uh, our step further. And we believe that we shall be the latter so that we uh, make this as a, as a conscious choice and uh, show the way. So how, how we do this in Genai, how we live that belief? So first of all, uh, um, you know, Genai is, um, we were established in 2004 uh, as, as a new company, new entrant in, in energy markets when the energy markets were uh, liberalized. Uh, and in 2016, we started to change or upgrade our vision. And we upgraded it uh, to the vision that by using state-of-the-art green technologies and digital solutions, we will carry out the green transformation of the Slovenian energy sector. Um, how, we do it, how we will do this? So uh, our mission was that, and it is, that we want to be a lead promoter of green transformation in matter ways. How we will do that? Uh, we work on several dimensions, actually three 
dimensions. One is inwards, so uh, how we are geared towards our employees. The second is how we are geared uh, towards our uh, customers. We have more than or approximately half a million customers. And how we are geared also towards our communities or so stakeholders in the energy sector. So let's start first with our people. Uh, what we did internally is that we started measuring our CO2 emissions or our carbon footprint and report on them in our reports. Uh, according to that, we also uh, saw exactly where we produce this uh, carbon footprint and we adopted different measures on how to lower it and how to achieve uh, the de decarbonizations. As a result, we also defined a goal that, that we want to achieve carbon neutrality by 2025. And just to give you an example, uh, in 2018, uh, our footprint was 3.1 tons of CO2 equivalents per employee. And with years, it actually diminished first in 2019 to 1.6, and then additionally on half by 2020 to 0.10 tons per employee. Uh, but this is not uh, the only thing. So we have different programs. And what we are focused on uh, is our employees, because uh, if we have the same mission, if we have and we should, if we hold, follow the, the same purpose, then uh, this is the only way how we, how we can achieve also all these changes on the market. So uh, as a result, we are building uh, uh, a strong culture, which, which is entrepreneurial culture. It's based on strengths, not weaknesses. And we uh, foster employee development and expanding or our green mission. Uh, just uh, for an example, uh, all of our new employees who join Genai, and for example, currently we are at about 600 employees, and only this year I believe that we will um, join uh, uh, to Genai, uh, 100 new employees will join. So uh, all these new employees uh, go in first months through. Uh, green, so-called green onboarding as part of the overall onboarding into the company where they focus on green projects and uh, uh, solve green issues. Uh, we also have uh, a group, uh, Earth Group, uh, where uh, people who join that group can uh, cultivate the, the, the company land, produce vegetables. We, we even have our own bees and produce honey. Um, Second dimension is business. So how we are achieving our goals through business. Uh, here we uh, follow two trends. One is green and the other is digital. And uh, as you can imagine, we, we define this strategy and uh, this vision, as I explained already five years ago. But the whole thing uh, due to Corona crisis, which is, of course, bad, but the Corona crisis only speed up and accelerated all, all those trends. So actually we as a company were on the right track and now we are just adding the speed in this transformation. When talking about green, uh, what we are doing is first, we are heavily investing in renewable energy sources. Uh, we established a new company, Genai Sonce, who produces uh, solar power plants for all segments from uh, households, so rooftop for households, through businesses, to energy communities. We, we, we are adding and, and putting a lot of our research resources in developing special products also for, for energy communities. Uh, second thing is investments in battery storage and DR. Why? Because uh, we are uh, electro engineers and we know that if we will add a lot of renewables to the grid, uh, the need for flexible power will be there. So that's why investments in battery storage and DR are also uh, one of our goals uh, because uh, we see opportunities there. And the third thing is that we activate private capital. Why is this important? Because traditionally, power sector was um, almost always backed by government capital. Instead, with green transformation, uh, we have strong incentives and strong will of private capital to be engaged 
and enter the sector. And actually, this has a number of positive effects on how to develop uh, and speed up the whole transition. Uh, in terms of digital, we built different analytic platforms. One of them is trading platform. So we, as an energy trading, uh, we see a, a special need how these new investors in renewable sources shall uh, market their production. And that's why we are uh, developing different uh, digital solutions, how to facilitate uh, uh, um, these goals and how to facilitate uh, uh, to, 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 to putting this new produce electricity on the market. The second thing are our customers and customers where we, um, um, uh, we are focused in user experience and digital interaction with our customers. And the third thing are IoT is, is, is the IoT platform. Why IoT platform? Because there will be a, a lot of new green technologies behind the meter are the customer, which ne will need to be orchestrated and need to operate not only behind the meter for achieving the goals behind the meter, but also in, in, in some, of, some of a synchronized war, uh, uh, way uh, with the grid uh, and with the situation that is in the grid, because in such a way we can uh, bring up the hosting capacity and uh, achieve our goals. So, uh, uh, we are investing heavily in renewables and storage. We are activating private capital and pension funds. We are uh, digitalizing power supply chain from producer to the customer and connecting different energy devices and customers and markets. The third dimensions are stakeholders. So our business, our, our community uh, 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 of stakeholders. What we did here is that together with uh, Slovenian TSO, LS, and three distribution companies, we established a green consortium, uh, which uh, has a mission of accelerating green transformation of the Slovenian power sector. Uh, this is extremely important because we are, uh, our goal is to, to, to find practical ways how to achieve this in, in, in a practical manner. And we are um, uh, uh, making a lot of discussions, researches, and, and calculations how to, uh, you know, um, uh, establish and, and push ahead uh, smart grid solutions in the grid and how to uh, prepare and transform the home system that it uh, will become uh, carbon neutral. Within the consortium, we also um, uh, did a lot of analysis and calculations of what should be uh, the pathway for the Slovenia in terms of power sector. And uh, we prepare those calculations, share them. And actually we, we calculated that by 2040, uh, uh, the, the CO2 free uh, production of electricity in Slovenia can exceed its consumptions. So the power sector can become uh, uh, neutral, uh, carbon neutral. Uh, and uh, in those calculations, we also um, consider that we will take a lot of load from other energy sectors, especially transmission, uh, the transportation, because we, um, uh, we included the electrification of uh, personal transport, which actually means that, that the consumption, overall consumption and consumption will fall because of the much higher efficiency of electric cars and that this additional consumption will be moved to uh, to power sector and we can cover that. And we calculated that we can do it. Um, now, in all these dimensions, at the end of the day, we are still a business company and we need to also need to look at uh, what we are doing, not only from the, from the glasses of what we would like to do, but also that we have at the end of the year, uh, positive financial results. And actually we see the whole transition and the whole pathway also as a very, very big business opportunity. For uh, this uh, reason, we um, prepared this year 
a new strategic uh, development plan of our group by 2030. And what uh, we, again, what we've calculated and came up is that by 2030, we can invest or we can produce investments of 1 billion euros into projects that will ac accelerate and enable the decarbonization of Slovenia. That means uh, a thousand megawatts of solar power plants of all sizes and all segments. And uh, for achieving that, we will need to at least double our employee base and uh, become a company with more than 1,300 employees. In such a way, uh, uh, we will also transform our business from a company which, is, which was in the past primarily a trading company, a supply company, into an integrated energy company. And this is actually our vision and our plan how we will do it. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, I'm open for any question. Thank you very much, Mr. Paravan. Uh, we said at the beginning that we would uh, give floor also to the to the questions from the audience. So I will be uh, letting maybe two questions after each presentation, and then we will have uh, additional time for discussion during the round tables. Uh, now I would like to uh, maybe make the first questions to Mr. Paravan uh, with respect to the investment. You said one billion euro until 2030. So how will be this distributed among the uh, among your company and among the private investor, which you also mentioned in your presentation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, very good. Actually, uh, um, more than half will be distributed or, or will be achieved through private investment. So actually, uh, our goal is to produce such projects, but the ways of how to finance it are many. Uh, you know, uh, already today, we are uh, constructing more than 1000 power plants uh, for uh, household customers per year, and uh, um, 50 of them for from business companies. And basically, all of those customers are putting their money into those investments, be because that sounds great for them, their financial bottom line. So from uh, that perspective, we, although the, the whole uh, figure is huge, we don't see issues there because uh, um, uh, those sources uh, are available and actually more, of, more, more than half of them will come from these uh, private uh, investors. Maybe just to conclude the question, uh, the private investor, they will need to lend money somewhere. Do, do, are you already in contact with some banks who would like to finance this transformation of your company? Yes, and we also see a lot of opportunity and a, a lot of will uh, that uh, private investors, especially funds, are nowadays uh, looking uh, uh, a lot for, for green investments because... This is something that they also made as their own goal. So uh, we, we for sure don't see issues in that regard. Uh, rather on the other way around. I believe that there is currently uh, the, 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 the offer of uh, such money to be investment in, in sound green projects. Uh, it's exceeding the, the projects uh, 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 offer on the other side. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Paravan, uh, for your presentation and your answers. We'd we'll be glad if you could also join us during the roundtable. Mm -hmm. And now let me uh, go to our next uh, keynote speaker, Mr. Richard Barron, who is Executive Director of the 2050 Pathways Platform, a multi-stakeholder initiative of countries, international financial institutions, think tanks and organizations with an interest in developing the Paris Agreement long-term low-emission development strategies. He will be discussing his title of his keynote uh, speech is uh, how important are the long-term strategies in particip how important that the long-term strategies are participatory and inclusive. Mr. Baron, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and, and thank you very much to the organizers for the uh, opportunity to be with you today. Uh, I wish I were in Slovenia. I have 
very fond memories of uh, my first visit to uh, the country in 95 to discuss those same issues. But uh, back then, climate was not as pressing as it is today. Uh, unfortunately, we're back here, but I see good progress being made. And, and thanks to the previous speakers for their inspiring notes. So you laid it out very well. The 2050 Pathways platform, which I'm leading, is indeed in the quote unquote business of supporting countries in developing their long term strategies. I should add to that that we operate mostly outside of Europe and most of what I'm going to be talking about is drawing from, from that experience. But these are the set of partners that we work with, but let me skip this and jump right into the, the topic. I thought I would start with uh, where we are with long term strategies, which is a as most of you know and ask from the Paris Agreement, there are now 33 countries who have tabled, submitted their strategies to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, including Slovenia. You see here a map, you will recognize yourself there as one of the few countries who has put forward a net zero or climate neutrality target uh, long-term strategy. So many more are coming. We are expecting about 50, including some very large uh, economies uh, that will cover a good chunk of global emissions. But nonetheless, we see even more countries that have made commitments to net zero or very low carbon development and have not yet started the work on long term strategies. And I think uh, working on filling that gap is not only a duty. We also need to do it uh, qualitatively well. And that includes developing strategies that are going to be most relevant to those countries. We do not want pieces of paper, we want processes, and we want processes that reflect fully where the country is, what the challenges are, and how to get to the, to the target. So we see this as a process, and what I would like to focus on here is this uh, part of the, of the LTS, which involves the public, which involves the private sector, which involves governments outside the Ministry of Environment, but including other line ministries and cross-cutting ministries, um, in a process that starts with a, a statement, usually, where a head of state or a minister says, we need to do this, uh, a visioning that is then elaborated, and I saw a lot of visioning in the Slovenian long-term strategy, for which I, I commend you. And then comes the discussion between those who look at the numbers and try to see how ambitious uh, the country might be, and those who have a say in how that ambition is going to be met, because they look at the impacts, they look at the opportunities. And then hopefully this all leads to better policy, better regulations, and better institutional change to drive all this and to drive the decarbonization uh, process. So why is it uh, important and why do we focus now on enabling societal consensus on this issue? Uh, let me quote from the OECD, a very recent report that indicates, and I think it's very well fit to the climate change issue, that the increasing complexity of policy making and the failure to find solution to some of the most pressing policy problems have prompted politicians, policymakers, civil society organizations, and citizens to reflect on how collective public decisions should be taken in the 21st century. And this is what we're talking about here. It's the importance of public engagement. We need to plan the economic transformation to a low carbon future, and that will require, we all know here, even though there are opportunities as shown by the previous speaker, it will require difficult decisions and the public should be informed and involved. And this will also help uh, the implementation of policies envisioned in the strategy. The consensus is necessary. The participatory process should be at the heart of long-term strategies to consolidate different viewpoints to co-create the strategy, raise awareness, and maximize what we call buy-in across the country. Interest groups should also be brought early in the process. Doing without them is not going to help. And then it's a question of who to engage. There's a variety of stakeholders that will be most affected by the uh, shift uh, implied by the long-term strategy. And they have to be in the design, including private sector, but also non-state actors that play a role in implementations. We think of subnational entities, civil society organizations, and experts. And then the general public should also be engaged uh, once that first phase of the long-term strategy uh, is done. So where does societal consensus help? Of course, we have seen more and more uh, that sensitization to climate is important. 
uh, people need to understand the severity and the challenges of the climate change problem because climate action cannot happen against or without citizens. There are issues such as carbon pricing and energy pricing. We see very, very uh, vivid examples of that today. So if the strategy implies any kind of cost increase to general consumers, uh, we have to announce those in advance and we have to understand the economic vulnerabilities and organize and announce the possible redistribution for a more progressive approach. And this has to be done in a very credible way. This cannot be projected out. It has to be very tangible. And I think the same approach, of course, should be taken as old carbon intensive practices are regulated out of the market and low carbon innovation are pushed in. Is the affordability of this assured? And if not, what should we do? This only we can hear from citizens' concerns. And then there are going to be regional transitions. Not all regions, coal basins, for instance, are equal against the, uh, the transition. So how do you embark those communities in the transition? And last, we all see in the scientific work that's been done on climate that deep emission reductions will be facilitated by behavioral change. If, if citizens um, and companies decide to uh, optimize mobility or to move with a softer means, if they decide to change diets, if consumption patterns are shifted towards less uh, resource intensive ways, this will greatly facilitate uh, our activities. Now, these changes cannot be forced, but they can be triggered by enhanced social awareness on climate implications of actions. And I think all of this will concur to facilitate the work. And this requires uh, a deep engagement of civil society and stakeholders. So there are a number of ways, and I will not go through all of those, uh, that we have seen in which countries actually encourage these sorts of participation and how they make it work. Uh, because it's all nice to have those words on the slide. You have to actually practically think, how am I going to do this? And in the uh, 2050 Pathways platform, a lot of our work is to help countries manage this process. So it's easy. You can actually think of organizing forums where you have high level representatives, but you also have society at large represented to establish how the, the process is going to be handled and to give everybody a role in it. Uh, we have seen also countries organize a number of round tables uh, during the elaboration of the LTS across different ministries. We see it more and more now, and it's no surprise to you all uh, in this event that there are more than just one ministry that needs to be involved in all this. In fact, I cannot think of a ministry that doesn't have something to do with the shift uh, of the economy and society to a low carbon. So in this case, we've seen each round table building on the previous one and being taken forward and getting to a, a long-term vision that was much more uh, encompassing than it would have been otherwise. Regional roundtables are also important in, in federal states. Uh, we also have seen uh, consultations in places like Costa Rica, uh, where there were sectoral specific stakeholders consultation. That's also an important part. Look at what it means for the specific sectors, their consumers, the supply chains, and so on. Uh, industry roadmaps are also a, an important way to engage uh, the Norwegian government, uh, I think some four or five years ago, ask their industry to independently develop their own roadmaps to low carbon and competitiveness. And they came back with more engagement with, uh, from those stakeholders who saw more of the opportunity uh, than the challenges, but were also creating uh, asks to the government to facilitate those, those things. And last but not least, we've all seen this, a number of online workshops can be organized such as this one. We've done this uh, in Morocco in particular, and this, this has been very successful in getting people to speak out, take the time, don't make it half an hour, make it three hours, uh, organize this well so that the feedback can be fed into the, uh, into the strategy. So a number of examples that we could elaborate on, but I don't have time to go over those now. Uh, it's also critical to engage uh, the wider public. Uh, we've seen public surveys being conducted over the, the long-term strategy, not over the whole document, but over specific elements where we think the public needs to uh, come in. Citizens' assemblies are a very important new development also in that space. France and the UK, but many other countries on other topics, and I refer to the OECD volume that I was citing from before, have organized assemblies where 
a set of uh, representatives of society at large, uh, not because they're institutionally representing society, but because they were picked uh, as part of society to represent you know, all different segments, uh, including different jobs, professions, level of income, came together to think collectively about climate and what the country should be doing about it. And it's amazing once these people have been informed, when they've talked to scientists from all sides to actually see how much engagement you get uh, in that process. Now for larger countries and countries with the, that are not digitalized, and I'm not gonna go into that so much, but there's also pamphlets that have been issued, you know, distributed to every single citizen to say, this is what we're doing. This is why it is important. Uh, there are other ways to do that. But in Bhutan, it was a flyer that they had to print uh, for this. But citizens assemblies, I think, is a, a space that I would like to, uh, to systematically stress as a very uh, important way forward. And let me go, not go too much uh, into the details of web-based interactive tools. But countries have developed also uh, instruments that people can use to actually test for themselves, you know, what does this actually mean? So if I want to push the emissions down to zero, what does it do to my transport? And they look up and see the sort of opportunities and options that are out there. Is electric vehicle the only option? And they can play with that. They can look at the cost uh, and see what it does to them. So these tools are increasingly available and I think might be helpful as well uh, to facilitate the, the discussion. Now, we also have, and because uh, we're in an institute that specializes in, in modeling, you, you may wonder, how do, how do I do this? How do I do this engagement when it comes to actually quantification of the strategy? I will not go into the details of this, but this is work we've done in cooperation with the Inter-American Development Bank. It's been done in Peru and Costa Rica, and it's been doing, done in, in other places now. The idea is to have modelers and stakeholders come together and say, OK, I'm going to hear you on what you think my assumptions are. You do not think that electric vehicles will be ready by 2025. So what if we push the date? And you go over all the assumptions. There are people who think that photovoltaics will cost twice what they cost today for whatever reason. You put that assumption in the range of assumptions. The people who think it would be half the cost, you put that assumption as well. And you explore the future on the basis of those ranges of assumptions. And then you see what is a robust policy setting that will still get you to where you want to be. And you discuss over that. And at least everybody's on board with, OK, my assumptions are taken into account. With those sets of policies, I see the trade-offs, but I see that we're going where we want to go. And you create a consensus uh, through, through such a method. Uh, this is called a robust decision making method. This was, uh, uh, I believe, invented by the Rand Corporation. You can, you can look it up and happy to provide more uh, details if necessary. So let me summarize for an inclusive long term strategy the transition to net zero emissions implies major social, economic, and technological transformations. And and the long-term strategy is really the place to start building consensus towards this transformation. It should be a quasi-social contract that is renewed between citizens, the government, and the whole of government, private sector actors co-shaping this vision for the country. We firmly believe and have seen this, that inclusiveness is critical to the elaboration of these cross-cutting and robust policy decisions, because climate policy should not and cannot be decided on, uh, on the basis of an average citizen's point of view. This though no longer works. We have seen it in France with the Yellow Vest movement. There's a segment of society that thought they were treated very unfairly with the policy that was being brought forward. If you look at this from an average GDP per capita perspective, you will for sure get it wrong. So inclusiveness is very important for that matter. But there is now a wealth of experience uh, in the long-term strategy space to organize effective consultations and inclusion of various stakeholders. Uh, the 2050 Pathways platform does provide a forum for this community of practice. We would be happy to have uh, Slovenia on board for this. And last but not least, I think we should approach the LTS as a process. Because it is such a long-term uh, horizon, this will have to be renewed constantly. This would have to be looked at on the basis of 
global trends on the basis of social reactions, we won't get it right in the first place. There is no LTS document out there now that has got it 100% right. No country that can actually guarantee that this will be implemented as written down. So see it as a process and looking beyond the, the official document, which is essential, but is only just a start. Um, so let me conclude by uh, a list of resources. I will not read through those, but to uh, the researchers in the room, and I know there are quite a few. I hope these are helpful. Uh, the presentation will be shared. And then I'll, I'll close with a, a quote from the uh, a prime minister from Fiji who said, having a good plan is not a sufficient condition for success, but not having one is always a recipe for failure. On that basis, I wish you a, a good workshop and a good work on the inclusiveness of, of this uh, important uh, uh, endeavor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from the audience, uh, Ms. Marta Ruslaniak. Uh, can we have a mic uh, turned on? Yes, please, Ms. Marta. Can you hear me? Yes. I hope that yes. Uh, I want to thank you for the excellent presentation. It was very nice to hear. Uh, my name is Marta Roswaniec. I'm work working for Kobisa uh, in Poland, and we are developing the project uh, that also tackle um, developing the platform for an uh, experts and stakeholders. So your experience would be uh, very great for us. Uh, the project, this is live project, live uh, view 2050. And uh, my question is uh, how, how we can encourage new people, how we also work out with um, burning, uh, burning out of those people who are working uh, on the, in that area for, I don't know, 10, 20 years, because the subject is very difficult. Uh, you need to knock to uh, different doors. Uh, and it, it can be very uh, exhausted for people. So uh, how we can pay, uh, help people to, to, to encourage them to, to new actions? This is my question. Thank you very much. Well, that's, that's the hardest of them all. But uh, let me say this. Um, I think it's important to reach out to communities, organizations that are not primarily climate communities, because I think most of them do see an interest in actually engaging in those discussions. Uh, we see this with uh, different religious groups. We see this with uh, people who worry about food issues, worry about health issues as well, so that you create a, a, a broader ground for a discussion that is going to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, believe me, having worked uh, with, with this issue for, uh, I think, 32 years now, um, I understand the feeling. Um, I think we have to care for each other as well, but, you know, you know that I think yeah, it's important to invest for this in the in the longer run. But reach out to a community that that is broader and see what support they can bring to to the cause, so to speak. Because this this has to be a a very encompassing effort. It cannot be limited just to environmental NGOs who, who believe in this. It, this has to be a truly social effort. So hang in there. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, we also have another question, Mr. Andrei Kranz, please. Can you turn on the mic, please? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Richard, for your excellent presentation. It was very interesting and informative. Uh, well, I have a question too, because I know you have um, much more insight in these things than I have, and much more data. But I'm thinking about one problem that is is now I think uh, uh, rather burning uh, with a lack of uh, um, energies with a, of um, let's say gas electricity in some countries that uh, are very progressive in this fight against climate change or in this quest for uh, uh, carbon neutrality and for example, in UK, in Germany, the consumption of coal is increasing there because they are lacking gas and the winter is coming and so on. So they need energy for heating besides uh, electricity production. So uh, what's your view on this? Uh, have they been doing something wrong, maybe 
too quickly or so on because things don't go as smoothly as they used to go for some time now. But now it looks like there are some problems. And uh, I believe that uh, bigger capacities for electricity uh, storage will help, but still do you think they should rethink about, uh, they think about the, their ways uh, or just continue and things will become better? Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. It's very good to see you here. Um, so it, one thing is for certain, and that is that the current energy situation in Europe is putting those issues to the fore. And people look at the situation now, they look both at the increase in prices and what it means for people. It pushes a discussion on energy efficiency and poverty, energy poverty eradication, on renovation of buildings and so on. And I think it's, it's very important for that matter to look at those scenarios that we do in those strategies as a bit of a fiction, not for the goal that they're trying to reach, but for the smoothness with which we're going to go to that goal and ask ourselves, what are the major uncertainties and accidents that might be happening along the way? And robustness should be tested against that. And I think in this case, and there were studies that were done along, along these lines uh, 10 years ago. I remember a study on, uh, that E3G had done. And, and, and the, the answer was always maximize your effort on energy efficiency, because less vulnerable you're going to be uh, on, the, on the demand side, less you'll see problems with have, you know, the occasional shift towards more carbon intensive when, in fact, um, uh, the prices push you in that direction. Now we have in Europe the emission trading system that should all keep this under a cap. And I think it's doing part of that job, but we want to avoid uh, some inertia that will say, well, gas seems to be an answer that is more attractive now. And we should promote that when we know that in 30 years, it should be completely done with. Um, so, um, Certainly, the situation now is difficult, and I see the same as, as you do. You know, uh, you put back some coal into the plants uh, because gas is too expensive. Uh, let's hope that this will only be uh, temporary. And I think what you said is absolutely right. We need to invest now firmly into infrastructure that we know is needed for uh, uh, arriving at decarbonization. Storage is one. Uh, we're far behind on that. Uh, I think we know the scenarios and so we should push along. So I hope uh, the previous speaker uh, will hear that message and, and be active on that front. So thank you very much, Mr. Baron, for your uh, presentation and your answers. Uh, we will continue now uh, with the next uh, keynote speaker. Uh, this is Mr. Alban Kitus from the European Commission. He's a policy officer in the Strategy and Economic Assessment Unit of DG Klima and has professional experience on energy and climate poli policies in public research, private sector, and in different services of European Commission. He will be presenting the Fit for 55 initiative or package by the European Commission. Mr. Kitus, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning. Sorry, I was muted. So good morning to all. Uh, my name is Alban Kitus. I work in the European Commission, DG Climate Action, in the unit dedicated to strategy and uh, economic assessment. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us to this uh, important conference. Uh, I would also like to congratulate uh, the project managers, these life project managers for uh, its success as shown by the, uh, this, this very ambitious and, and comprehensive agenda of, of uh, this very conference. And also because it came to fruition, as we understand in terms of uh, building uh, an analytical capacity for Slovenia, uh, which, we, which we saw translated also in the uh, national long-term strategy submitted to, to the commission over summer. So this morning I will I will present uh, uh, where we stand in terms of climate targets uh, in the EU, and uh, and the role of the recently published uh, so-called Fit for 55 policy package, uh, which was uh, which came out uh, over summer in July. So the first. 
the first part on, on the climate target um, actually was kick-started by the publication in December 2019 of the European Green Deal communication. So the European Green Deal is actually a, a large uh, um, uh, set of initiatives to modernize and transform the EU economy as a whole uh, for a more sustainable future. So it builds an, uh, upon a number of blocks that you can see here uh, on this uh, diagram. Uh, and uh, one of them, one uh, important one, is uh, what shows on the uh, top left uh, box, uh, which, which is uh, about increasing the EU's climate emission for 2030 and 2050. Of course, a number of, uh, of these other blocks all relate to that climate ambition, uh, as you can see, supplying clean, affordable and secure energy, uh, industry for a clean and circular economy, uh, uh, clean and sustainable uh, mobility, and so on and so forth. But uh, maybe to mention here that this European Green Deal goes uh, beyond also uh, climate, climate, uh, climate policies. Two important pillars of this Green Deal uh, appear uh, in, in the two boxes below, uh, financing the transition and leave no one behind. We need just transition for that transition to succeed. So this European Green Deal uh, actually uh, is anchored into the Paris Agreement and, its, and the development uh, since with the objective to hold a global temperature increase to well below 2 degree and pressure efforts to limit it to 1.5 degree. In that context, uh, the European Commission published in November 2018, a communication entitled Clean Planet, Planet for All, which calls for a, a climate neutral EU economy um, as a contribution to this Paris uh, Agreement objective. That objective, uh, that target of climate neutrality proposed by Commission uh, was endorsed by EU leaders, leaders in December 2019, so one, one year after, and is now enshrined in the, as a binding objective in the EU climate law, which was uh, published in June 2021, so uh, a few months uh, ago. In parallel to, to, uh, to this climate neutrality long-term objective, Commission also worked um, to propose a revised 2030 target uh, to get to our longer term objective in a, in a smoother way or in a, in, a, in a better way. So that's translated into uh, the publication in September 2020, so a year ago, of the Climate Target Plan, which uh, basically proposed um, for the EU economy to achieve a revised upgraded uh, greenhouse gas reduction target to at least 55% net by 2030 compared to, to 1990. That's, this is to be compared with the existing framework uh, then in place, which called for a 23rd target of at least 40%. I will say a word at, at the end of my presentation on, on, the, uh, on the role of the uh, governance regulation for the energy union and climate action, which uh, of course uh, will, uh, will have a very important role to play. Uh, also to say that, of course, these different initiatives uh, didn't come out of uh, nowhere. There was already an, an already existing uh, climate, energy and transport policy framework for the EU uh, to, to, achieve, uh, to achieve climate ambition. But all this framework has now been uh, or is in, in the process of being updated. So as I said, these two objectives uh, for 2030 and beyond to 2050 are now uh, binding objectives uh, in the European climate law, uh, which define Indian-wide domestic uh, objectives for these two um, dates, uh, with, uh, in addition, uh, recognition of the need to enhance uh, the EU's carbon sink in that, in that context, okay, both for 2030 and, and 2050. So, how do we get there? Um, this is the purpose of, uh, of the uh, policy package, which was published in, in, in July. Uh, it's a so-called Fit for 55, which, which is part of the delivering the European Green Deal uh, policy environment. So in July, uh, Commission released um, 
13 uh, legislative proposals to deliver on, on the 2030 package to, to set the EU economy on track to, to a climate neutral um, environment in 2050. You can see the, here in this, uh, in this uh, diagram, the different initiatives, both legislative and non-legislative, to get to the 20, to the proposed, I mean, to, to now to the agreed 2030 climate targets of 55% uh, net reductions of GHGs. So this overall package uh, aims uh, at, at different objectives. Uh, it, it aims at a, a fair uh, transition to get there. I think it was, uh, this point was stressed by Richard and very rightly so, but something that the commission is, is, uh, is putting a lot of effort and, and care in. Uh, it, it has to be uh, cost efficient and it has to be uh, done in a competitive manner uh, so, so as to uh, modernize or contribute to the modernization of the e EU economy in general at large. So this package uh, is actually uh, a mix or a combination um, that uh, puts together a number of uh, different instruments, uh, pricing uh, or price-based instruments, uh, quantity-based targets, um, a number of uh, sector-specific uh, regulations, and uh, framed in, a, in an overall context of support measures to uh, accompany the, uh, the, the uh, just transition, which is again uh, a required condition for all that to actually uh, take place eventually. On this slide, you can see the, uh, a, a very high level overview of uh, this policy mix with these different, these three pillars I mentioned, so price-based instruments, uh, quantity-based targets, and sectoral rules. And you can see um, at the bottom, uh, uh, this, this kind of a horizontal layer, uh, this cross-cutting uh, dimension on support measures. Uh, where you, you will find uh, enhanced uh, existing uh, instruments like the modernization fund or the innovation fund, but also new instruments uh, that I will uh, de uh, detail a bit further in, in, a couple, in a couple of slides. We think that uh, all these, uh, I mean, this, this layer, these support measures uh, dimension is, is again uh, critical to, to succeed in reaching our climate goals. So we'll now go very briefly through these different uh, main building blocks of the package, uh, which, is, uh, which is being uh, now discussed with uh, the co-legislators, with member states and the parliament. So an important one is the uh, EU emission trading uh, system. Um, so there we have a number of, we propose a number of uh, initiatives and provisions on uh, the existing, first the existing ATS, which will have a, a strengthened target. Um, plus a number of revised provision to make it uh, fit for purpose. And the uh, Commission is also proposing a new ETS uh, for uh, new sectors, uh, road transport and buildings, uh, um, which will be backed uh, by this social climate fund okay, to address possible social impacts. I'll come back to, to that in, in a minute. So the emission trading system is, uh, is one of the uh, yeah, most, most important and overarching uh, tool or instrument to, uh, to lead the EU economy to reduce its, uh, its GHG emissions across the board. I mean, for a number of sectors, not all sectors are covered, but for a number of sectors, uh, especially related to, to energy, energy combustion. Uh, Price-based instruments also, I mean, the ETS is complemented by uh, policy measures on taxation and trade. Um, we propose a revision of the energy taxation directive to shift away tax incentives uh, from, from uh, for fossil fuels towards clean technologies. And we also propose to put in place a mechanism to prevent carbon leakage um, for, for our industry in the form of a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Now, if I move to, uh, to targets, uh, quantity-based targets, uh, we propose a revision of the effort sharing regulation, which uh, covers uh, sectors which were not so far, I mean, which are not so far uh, covered by the emission trading system. So we propose to keep the existing architecture and scope, um, but we propose to increase the uh, associated emission uh, targets by 11 percentage points. So uh, the current target is 29% compared to 2005. We propose to uh, 
updated to 40%. Next to this, uh, the Commission proposed also a revision of the uh, legislation on uh, land use and ch change and forestry to enhance the role of things uh, in, in, the, in reaching our climate, uh, climate goals. Um, we, uh, we, we now propose a binding target to increase net carbon removals uh, to, uh, up to 310 million tons CO2 equivalent in 2030. We also propose an EU-wide target for a climate neutral uh, land use, forestry, and agricultural sector by 2035. So it's called AFOLU sector. So that's basic, this initiative goes beyond 2030. Next to, to, this, uh, to this climate um, instrument, um, we also went into sectoral uh, initiatives, uh, chiefly uh, the energy sector. We propose a revision of the renewable energy directive to bring more energy into our energy mix. Um, we have proposed overall renewable ambition uh, up to 40% as compared to 32% as per the, um, the existing targets. And that should play out in, in the different sectors uh, of the energy system, uh, heating and cooling, transport, uh, industry, and so on and so forth. And also power system. Uh, we aim at facilitating the energy system integration uh, dimension, which uh, I think is also addressed uh, in, your, in your conference uh, through, through a spe specific session. Uh, and finally, and importantly, we propose to uh, strengthen the uh, sustainability criteria on, on bioenergy. We also, the European Green Deal, as I mentioned, is, is about climate, but it's, it goes beyond and, um, and, and it also um, includes uh, the important dimension of biodiversity. We propose to revise the energy efficiency directive, uh, again, to strengthen uh, the contribution of that uh, policy dimension to our climate targets with notably and uh, strengthening of the, of the energy efficiency targets as compared to uh, the existing ones for, for 2030. Uh, the package includes a number of uh, initiatives and actions on transport uh, that includes uh, CO2 emission standards for cars and vans, that includes uh, the infrastructure uh, that will need to accompany uh, development of new uh, types of uh, vehicles and new mobility. And uh, that also covers aviation and maritime uh, sectors, which are two important and growing sectors in, in terms of change emissions and, and energy uh, demand. So uh, I'm now moving to the last bit of my presentation. Um, and I have two slides on the uh, support measures. Uh, again, as I said at the beginning, and as uh, uh, underlined by uh, Richard, this, uh, the, the, fa the fair transition question or uh, aim is, uh, we think, is, is critical. Um, I mentioned already the Social Climate Fund. fund that's a new uh, instrument to uh, accompany uh, notably households um, and people, basically, to, um, to, to adapt to the new uh, policy environment and to the, to, to, to the changing um, uh, conditions for their own you know, uh, uh, living uh, conditions. Uh, it, will also, it also aims at supporting investments uh, in, um, in important elements uh, like energy efficiency, renovation, cleaning, heating and cooling, integration of renewables. Of course, it's, uh, in the previous session, we had a, a question on um, you know, the, uh, the difference between um, what's happening now and, and also the, the need to have a long-term perspective. This social climate fund is also here to uh, invest in a, in, in, a, in a progressive transition and to make sure that by 2030, uh, the system is resilient to, to uh, volatility, be it in terms of uh, you know, prices and, and houses. Um, and finally, this climate fund will uh, finance the uh, zero and, and low emission mobility, so a new mobility for the EU citizen. It will be financed by the uh, new ETS uh, through uh, an allocation of, of um, part and 25% uh, of the expected revenues of this ETS. This uh, social climate fund uh, accompanies or com complements the existing modernization fund and innovation fund, which have been which have 
uh, both been uh, upgraded or updated to, um, to support the transition and also to support uh, yeah, redistribution and, um, and modernization of, of the uh, economy of a number of, uh, of low income member states. These uh, three instruments I just mentioned uh, are, are not in isolation. Uh, I should also mention here the, uh, the Just Transition Fund, uh, which, will, which will also play an important role in that context. And also, of course, uh, the Recovery and Resilient Facility uh, financing, which, um, which set a minimum of 37% of all investments to be de dedicated to, to climate policy. So, we hope that uh, all the, these instruments and um, accompanying measures will, uh, you know, will 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 make that transition uh, a reality uh, by 2030. So, on that, uh, I, I and to conclude, uh, what are the next steps now? Uh, of course, we are now engaged into a phase of political uh, negotiation on all these initiatives. But beyond that, uh, the existing regulation on energy union and climate action will play an important role. Um, I can mention here already that uh, we are expected to, to receive uh, updates of the national energy and climate plans by June 2023. Uh, we think it will be an important uh, moment to uh, reflect upon all uh, these different initiatives and how these new targets and instruments translate into international action. Um, if it, but will undoubtedly be uh, you know, a topic of, uh, of discussion between the Commission and, and member states in, in the coming years. So, all right, so I'm, I'm done now with my presentation and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Kitus. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, there is one question. Uh, no, the, 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 this was a mistake. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, maybe what is the, the time schedule for the uh, implementation of the uh, fifth of fifth 455? Uh, you said that you expect that the member states will uh, react uh, with their uh, NECP, uh, National Energy and Climate Change Plans, in June 23. When can we expect that the final decisions could be made? That's completely uh, out of my uh, or beyond my uh, my reach. It all depends on how the um, negotiation for you know each and every single uh, initiative is is uh, is uh, developing in the coming uh, month. So this I can I cannot really comment on that. Uh, we uh, I guess that we hope that uh, we'll have a stable um, you know an agreed policy framework. Uh, in view of uh, indeed updating these NECPs to to get to to our 2030 objective. Uh, there is a question uh, from the audience. Uh, will be able that the member states and the European Parliament could change this plan of Euromia Com European Commission? Well, what's, uh, what is now set and um, jointly agreed is uh, the 55 uh, climate target for 2030 and the uh, climate neutrality target uh, for uh, 2050. Uh, we, we strongly, we are convinced and we strongly believe that the uh, policy package proposed uh, is the right one to get there. Um, so, Again, we will we'll see how, how we, these uh, negotiations uh, yeah, uh, develop over time. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Kitus, uh, for your presentation and your answers. Uh, I think that we'll be hearing a lot about the Fit, fit for 55 because it brings really a strong goal towards uh, all of the uh, community, the the, uh, the community who is involved uh, in the preparation of the long-term strategies. Uh, thank you again. And uh, now, dear participants, will continue with the lectures, uh, which we invited three presentations uh, into it. Uh, what can we learn from each other? And the first per presenter will be Mr. Ayol de Grot the head of unit for policy analysis from Department of Cl for Climate Policy of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy of, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, he's working uh, in the NL Climate Agreement, a secretary 
and he worked also as an economist and uh, we think that we can all learn from the experiences from Netherlands. Uh, Mr. De Groot, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation and opportunity to uh, speak at this uh, conference. Um, I will attempt to share my screen. Is it visible for everybody? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, what I would like to do is, uh, of course, there's a lot of, if we talk about experiences uh, we, and long-term strategy in climate policy, we can we can uh, talk about a lot of, lot of things. What I would like to do um, is give you a very brief overview of um, uh, where we stand currently in the Netherlands on uh, climate policy, uh, uh, but also give you some insight in how the policy discussion is currently evolving. Um, I think it's very important when we talk about long term that we always think about how we translate um, the uh, long term into uh, what it implies for short term actions. Uh, so I would uh, like to uh, talk about that. Um, and finally, uh, also point out some challenges we, we currently face and are currently working on, which hopefully are uh, a nice uh, setup for uh, the discussions later on uh, today. Um, well, first of all, um, I would start with a, with a timeline that, that gives you insight in, in what the important steps have been in recent years in the Netherlands on uh, climate policy. We, we've had a lot of developments uh, since 2017, uh, when uh, the, new, the then uh, new coalition uh, decided in its coalition agreement to introduce a climate law, uh, with, uh, which was then uh, um, um, uh, aimed at the target of minus 95% by 2015 and uh, minus 49% in 2030. Uh, and it was also announced in the coalition agreement uh, that the government would be a strong advocate of uh, raising the EU, EU target to minus 55% in the EU. Uh, and it was announced that um, uh, um, the first climate plan in the climate law uh, was to be based on a broad societal uh, consensus uh, via the national uh, national climate agreement. Um, this was a broad stakeholder process which took about uh, one and a half years um, and in 2019 this climate agreement was uh, uh, reached. Um, and. Um, in uh, so we started the implementation and of course there have been a lot of developments on the EU level uh, which the, the previous speaker uh, uh, um, uh, set out for us um, and in 2020 uh, our current cabinet asked an independent uh, expert group study group to study the impacts of the Green Deal and draft policy recommendations for the next cabinet uh, uh, what the impact would be on uh, national choices in climate policy. Uh, this study group then published its findings in January 2021, uh, prior to the uh, national elections. Uh, and uh, an important message was that uh, while there has been published a broad national climate agreement, a lot of developments uh, in policy, uh, it's still not enough to uh, meet the goals and uh, also not enough to meet the new goals uh, that follow from the, the, the EU uh, Fit for 55 package. Um, in March 2021, uh, we had uh, the national elections. And then on the right side of the screen, you see a big question mark because we have been awaiting a new cabinet uh, since uh, March. Uh, uh, talks about um, the new government are still ongoing. Uh, climate is one of the important topics, uh, but we still, um, are awaiting uh, the new cabinet and of course we need the new cabinet to make uh, political decisions on the way we will move forward with climate policy. On my next slide I would like to give you an overview of what the current climate policy in a nutshell is in the Netherlands. Um, first of all uh, we have a national goal that was set in law uh, minus 49%, which was derived from the long-term goal, minus 95%. Uh, of course, this climate law will now have to be amended to bring it to align it with the new European climate law. So this is already announced by the current cabinet that, that this will be changed 
to align it with uh, climate neutrality. Um, but these are the targets that are currently in, uh, in the law. And um, uh, the long-term goal, minus 95%, uh, was translated into a 2030 goal um, uh, by basically the idea that uh, the transition should be uh, gradual and linear towards 2050. Um, in the Netherlands, we have, uh, in ETS, we have seen uh, since 1990 uh, below average uh, reductions uh, relative to the EU average and in ESR above EU average reductions. And the idea was that uh, it would be uh, um, efficient to uh, uh, accelerate uh, the rate of reduction also in ETS sectors. Uh, and also put in place national policies in addition to ETS to reach this acceleration of reductions. Um, this was the starting point basically for the climate agreement, uh, the broad process um, uh, which uh, uh, Mr. Barron in his presentation talked about the different steps in the uh, process of, of, of making a long-term strategy. And I think that a lot of the steps he talked about we at least try to uh, uh, implement those in uh, the process towards the climate agreement. Um, and the starting point uh, was an analytical starting point. Uh, our environmental assessment agency, which is our in independent body, uh, <clears throat> made an analysis of the 2030 targets and translated it into tentative targets for five sectors. And uh, what was very important for uh, the Dutch cabinet was that um, the, the climate policy was to be cost effective. So this was an analysis based on national cost effectiveness. And basically the question was, if you want to reach minus 49% in 2030, what would be a cost effective approach and what we, would be a cost effective distribution of uh, this target among the different sectors? Um, industry and electricity um, um, were very, um, uh, the district, the the large large part of the uh, ambition uh, was put in ETS, so industry and electricity, because of this cost-effective approach um, relative to the ESR, ESR sectors, um, and because of this relative strong focus on the implementation of cost-effective techniques towards 2030, uh, yeah, the, the greatest reductions are to be expected in ETS. Uh, important messages are the phase out of coal-fired electricity phasing of renewables and the cost effective reduction of emissions in industry, for example, through uh, CCS. Um, and the long term feed it into this, this climate accord process through uh, the development of a mission oriented innovation agenda, basically. So there, there were uh, also part of the climate agreement um, was the idea that we have to prepare for the period after 2030. So in addition to a strategy to uh, 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 make incremental steps in reducing emissions uh, towards 2030. Um, uh, we have to prepare for the period after 2030. Um, and uh, an important pillar in this was the development of a mission oriented uh, innovation agenda. Um, you can forget about the numbers on the right hand side. These were all based relative to the current policy baselines in 2017. Uh, basic message to take away from this graph is that uh, the largest part of the uh, additional uh, ambition in the Dutch climate policy is really on the ETS side because of this cost effective approach. Where we currently stand is that we have some policy changes on the horizon um, in response to uh, uh, the updated 2030 and 2050 targets. I uh, already uh, talked about the Dutch Climate Act and that it will be amended to align it with the EU Climate Act and the target of climate neutrality in 2050. So this is already uh, put in motion. Um, we've also um, seen in recent projections in the Netherlands that our current policy mix from the climate agreement, uh, which was uh, 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 part of the first climate plan, is still insufficient to reach the current target of minus 49%. Um, and based on the most recent insights, uh, we will reach about minus 43% reduction by 2030, which is uh, not enough. Um, and in addition, we of course have the EU Green Deal. Uh, and we have to think about implementing policies to meet the higher ESR targets. 
Um, of course, 2050 is the ultimate target. And um, the study group that, that, that advised the government on how to translate the EU Green Deal to uh, the Dutch uh, situation and the, the political, political choices on the national level, uh, um, also said in its report that uh, it's important to not only think about uh, uh, increasing the effort to reach the 2030 targets, but also think about um, uh, think about more and put more stronger focus on 2050, which is of course uh, the ultimate target. Um, and basically, the message was that Dutch policy has to better account for preparing for reduction efforts beyond 2030, uh, taking into account the impact of climate neutrality. Uh, and we are very much in the process of um, uh, of of of, of yeah, realigning climate policy within the new. Uh, policy context. Um, the important political decisions uh, we need to, to, to really uh, make the next step are expected as part of the new coalition agreement. And as I already talk, uh, said, we are uh, still awaiting uh, the new cabinet and uh, uh, we are actually awaiting it since March 20. This is a long time. Sorry, I yelled. Ik zit langer niet te zien je contacten. I have a problem with my Siri popping up on my MacBook. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, so moving on to some challenges we currently uh, face. Uh, we are currently thinking about realigning uh, uh, policy uh, with the new uh, within the new context. Um, and basically, the, 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 the approach within the uh, climate agreement uh, was, uh, you could summarize it as a more or less incremental approach, uh, translating the 2050 target to 2030, and then thinking about what would be the most cost effective way of reaching this 2030 target. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of a tension uh, uh, between that approach and the approach of the necessary you know, transition of systems you need to achieve climate neutrality and how to plan for this even greater transition. And to make this a little bit more uh, specific, um, in the Netherlands, we have a large energy intensive, uh, intensive uh, industry and uh, one of the largest emitters of uh, 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 CO2 in the Netherlands uh, is uh, Tata Steel. They worked on a strategy of reducing its emissions uh, uh, through uh, the implementation of uh, uh, CCS. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about, uh, uh, about this strategy. Um, and recently they announced that they are changing their strategy uh, to uh, basing uh, their steel production on green hydrogen. Uh, but at the same time, they also announced that uh, they need a lot of government support to get to this real uh, 2050 climate neutrality proof strategy. Uh, so I think this is a very concrete example of uh, 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 also from a business perspective and company perspective of what, what strategy uh, should we use? Should it be uh, uh, implementing uh, technology that's, that is already available or do we really um, uh, 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 invest in, in, in and implement technologies which are a little bit more uncertain, uh, but are more climate neutrality proof. Um, and this is th th this this specific example uh, translates, I think, to the broader um, uh, question we have in policy in the Netherlands, specifically, of uh, what should be the right balance between short-term action, getting to your 2030 goals and preparing for the transition and the reductions in the period after 2030 and really implementing the technologies that are uh, climate neutrality proof. Um, another very important aspect currently in the Netherlands is uh, the intersectoral coordination and planning uh, of the transition of the energy system. Um, already um, uh, said we have a large energy intensive industry uh, and really the balance between uh, the uh, reduction of emissions in, uh, uh, in industry uh, and the uh, investment in uh, uh, infrastructure that is, that is future-proof um, is really uh, a very big priority currently. Um, for example, uh, 
the the announcement of uh, Data Steel that it will uh, really wants to to try to reach its uh, uh, um, uh, uh, climate ambitions through um, uh, the implementation of uh, technologies that use green hydrogen. Hydrogen, of course, has a lot of uh, uh, effects uh, in the energy system, and we have to think about um, the the conditions under which this is possible. Uh, so all these sectors that we had in the climate agreement, uh, they all did, made their plans and they're all interconnected. Um, and then you get to the problem of scarcity. Uh, how do we uh, um, distribute the scarcity in uh, capacity of the energy system, which investments should be prioritized as opposed to other investments? Uh, this is a really uh, in, important uh, uh, aspect of the transition we are currently working on and which is all, is, has been uh, very important, um, uh, uh, very important uh, topic that 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 came about in recent years uh, since the climate agreement. Um, I won't go into detail of all the uh, points I mentioned here. I think I think a lot of it is is recognizable for everybody. Um, uh, I think I would like to to make a final remark about the, the third point that. Um, uh, I think that what is good about the EU Green Deal is that it really thinks about 2050, translates it to action in the short term, um, and uh, talks about really the, the, what, what should be the, the pathway, the strategy, and also the investment strategy to reach climate neutrality in all these sectors. And we are very much in the process of thinking about what this implies in the different sectors in the Netherlands. Um, this, is, this process is very much ongoing. Uh, I was triggered by um, the, the point of Mr. Barron that it's very important to reach societal consensus and also to test assumptions with parties. Uh, we have done that in a climate agreement and we have also learned that, well, the transition is a learning process. So we are currently, um, uh, feed, based on what we have learned, uh, 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 re-evaluating it in the, in, the, in the changing context. And we now have to think about uh, what it implies for uh, the detailed pathways. We don't have all the answers yet, uh, uh, far from it. Um, uh, but I think that the, uh, uh, the specific uh, uh, example of um, the transition in the energy intensive, intensive industry shows that what the tension can be between uh, uh, planning for incremental national cost effective approach to reach your 2030 targets uh, versus uh, uh, preparing for the uh, bigger transition for climate neutrality. And we really have to uh, think about the balance between uh, these uh, techniques that are maybe cheaper in the long term versus action uh, and investing in technologies that are uh, more expensive, but prepare for the longer term. Um, I would like to leave it at that. Maybe there are questions that I can answer. Uh, and I hope this uh, is a nice introduction about uh, the Dutch experience for uh, the discussion later on today. Thank you for pres your presentation. Uh, as there are no di direct questions right now, I will say save some time uh, because you will be joining us at the uh, round table later on and uh, let us uh, think about some questions uh, for that uh, part. And I would like to invite uh, Ms. Gertraud Volansky, senior expert from Austrian Federal Ministry of Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology for her presentation on long-term climate strategy for Austria. Ms. Volansky, the floor is yours. Thank you and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here with you and uh, to listen to all these uh, very uh, insightful presentations. And um, let me try to share um, my screen to show you my slides. I'm not the good expert at that, but I'll try. You see, um, I'm not good at that. Yes, you. Uh, 
you can click F5 on your yeah. on your keyboard. F5 on the top of your key keyboard. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, that's capacity building across borders. Um, I will say a few words on our long-term strategy um, for uh, achieving climate neutrality. Um, we have an existing um, long-term strategy uh, for 2050, um, which we submitted uh, to the EU uh, by the end of 2019 and to the UNFCCC in 2020. Um, to fulfill all the formal requirements um, of, of timing and so on. The objective of that strategy was um, to achieve uh, climate neutrality by 2050, um, as is in line with the Paris Agreement and most other um, long-term strategies that I've seen so far. Um, we also tried to follow the provisions of the governance regulation as closely as possible. And I'll say a little more about that uh, in a minute. On the process, um, we tried to do this as inclusively as possible. Um, in a very short time, um, we started um, the proceedings uh, for developing uh, this uh, long-term strategy um, in May 2019, and we submitted it uh, at the end of December. Um, so that um, was a quite ambitious um, a a schedule, I have to say. But uh, we managed to um, put into these short months um, three stakeholder workshops, um, an online consultation uh, with um, a lot of questions on um, the targets and the measures proposed. Um, and this consultation received quite a good um, show of reactions. We had more than 2,700 participants. Um, not all of them made it to the end because I, I think um, looking back at it that uh, the question there may have been too long. But still, we had a, a really strong level of commitment from the public um, to our uh, to the proposed targets and to the um, to taking ambitious measures and that was uh, very reassuring. Um, 2,700 may not seem a lot, but um, we were told that for a consultation of this kind, um, it's quite satisfactory. Um, I will not go through the strategy um, as by saying that we followed the um, governance regulation, um, you have an idea that we covered all the sectors. Um, we covered finance, um, just transition, um, yeah, adaptation as far as we could. Instead, I would like to show you that um, we had a few pathways um, that would lead to net zero in 2050. And they were calculated um, with the assistance uh, of our um, climate calculator. We had, of course, we could have had more pathways, but we focused only on those that would le really lead us to net zero in 2050. So we had one based on high use of renewable energy, um, substantial changes in consumption patterns, and um, compensation by natural sinks and by a moderate use of CCS and CCU. And at this point, um, I can point out that um, currently we have a law um, prohibiting the use of CCS uh, except for um, exploration purposes. Um, but um, we have come to recognize that um, 
we will probably not be able to keep up that ban and that um, uh, for achieving net zero, um, it's uh, we have to think about um, CCS and CCU as well. A second pathway um, focused um, also on renewables and uh, efficiency, um, but also on the import of bioenergy and hydrogen. Um, and then um, in this pathway, we also foresee a much higher degree of CCS and CCU. And you see that it does not contain um, substantial changes in consumption patterns, which is an important element of pathway A. On C, um, no import of bioenergy and hydrogen. Um, and a high use of um, biomass. So of course, this reduces the capacity of the forest as a carbon sink and uh, an even higher use of CCS and CCU. And pathway D, um, again, uh, we assumed um, import of bioenergy and hydrogen um, and then um, no CCS and CCU um, because uh, we foresee a high um, amount of carbon capture in the forest. Um, I will not comment on the, uh, how realistic any of these pathways are, um, but these were um, a few basic scenarios to choose from. You see it here in the slide. Um, we always have um, the main pathway um, to reduce the emissions and the corresponding pathway um, below the uh, zero line to uh, compensate for the missing uh, reductions uh, of, of the pathway. And uh, we also see that um, with pathway B, um, the difference is the highest. So as I said, we uh, finalized this strategy in end of 2019. And I think we learned a few lessons from uh, the development of that strategy. Um, I think it's clear that any long-term strategy needs uh, to be a, a living document. Uh, it cannot be something fixed. Uh, you cannot pro uh, make a scenario uh, or a policy that covers um, 30 years. Um, that's absolutely unrealistic. And that you need to build in um, reviews um, as necessary and uh, probably quite often. Um, because targets change, like the EU targets uh, and the targets for the member states, and also the framework conditions change, like um, political approaches, um, like legislation, um, and also public awareness and, and circumstances. We also learned that... Um, going into too much detail um, is not necessarily helpful. And that also um, relates uh, to the necessity of having a living document. The more detail you put in, um, the less easy it is um, to make necessary adaptations. Um, rather, you, um, you dig yourself in, into details uh, that, are not, that are quite hard to change after some time. We also saw that uh, some of the requirements of the governance regulation proved uh, quite difficult to fulfill. Um, one of them was getting a national estimate of investment costs. Um, we do have um, estimates for the EU. We have global estimates. 
um, but we were not able to do the modeling um, and the calculations for Austria um, in, in the short time that, that we had. And I'm not sure if we had, have, had had a longer time that we would have been able to do that with any amount of accuracy. Um, and what we also learned is um, we were a little surprised, I have to confess, that civil society uh, support uh, for ambitious action was so strong. Um, and uh, we should have built uh, much more on that and tried to raise the support um, earlier and not, um, not only see that in the, um, in the online consultation. This strategy that we have uh, for climate neutrality 2050 um, has been uh, overtaken um, by the Austrian government's decision to define 2040 as a target year for climate neutrality. Um, this decision is a part of the um, current government's coalition agreement uh, from uh, early 2020. Um, and it, it makes, um, as you can easily imagine, a lot of difference uh, to the validity of the strategy that we have. Um, we have not yet um, achieved a political decision to um, have an update uh, on the strategy or rather have a new strategy uh, for uh, 2040. We have had, of course, internal discussions and we have uh, done some work on that. Um, and of course, it's not simply a matter of changing the dates. It's a matter of changing um, the whole approach. Um, we can make use of the lessons learned. Um, and if we do a new strategy, it has to be much more flexible. Um, and it has to contain a real vision for every sector uh, where we want to be in 2040. Um, of course, it has to have pathways um, like we did before, um, but it should not contain um, a whole range of policies and measures filling many pages that have to be revised anyway. We also have to take into account the changes in the EU legislation and the changes in the targets um, with the new um, effort sharing uh, decision um, draft on the table. Um, this means a lot of change for Austria. Um, and uh, we have new national legislation and planning on climate and energy, um, including carbon pricing, which was um, just announced by the Austrian government um, last Sunday. So all these issues need to be taken into account when we develop um, a new um, long-term plan for 2040. Um, what we is also see is that um, the awareness has, of the public has been, um, is even stronger now than it was uh, two years ago. Um, we see the effects of climate change uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, we see it in Austria, and I think this gives a necessary push from the public side. Um, for making ambitious uh, decisions. Um, I want to show you um, one slide uh, about uh, an example of a pathway for 2040. And uh, sorry that it's in German, but you see that um, the remaining um, emissions uh, come from mainly from energy and industry after 2040, uh, then from agriculture, 
and also from, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, that was too quick. Um, so um, you see that uh, there is still a lot to compensate and uh, we are aware that this cannot be done uh, through a biomass um, capture in, um, in forests alone, and we will need technical solutions as, as well. Um, and I would like to finish on a note um, answering those who say that uh, Austria is such a small country and what we do doesn't matter uh, in the big global picture. Um, so I'd like to quote Greta Thunberg, um, who said, you are never too small to make a difference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Wolanski, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I will also uh, use your time during the round table for uh, any questions and discussions. So I thank you uh, for the time being, and I would like to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Katarina Trasteniak from Josef Stefan Institute to present the Experiences of Life Climate Path 2050 project, extensive consultations on LTS background analysis. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. I know we're running slightly behind the schedule, but please allow me just to say a few more words about the project, just to give you a bigger overview, actually, what we did in these past four years, and also because I'm the first speaker also uh, talking specifically about our project. So actually, we heard already today what was the project aim of Life Climate Path, was actually to enhance the use of quantitative analysis among decision makers and stakeholders. And of course, to improve support in policy making for planning the climate actions and monitoring process and guiding of the existing climate measures. So what I would also like to, to present to you is this is our house, as we call it, is how actually Life Climate Path project was built. So we had uh, three different pillars, so to say. One was actually analysis when we were doing the climate path. So this means projection, greenhouse gas emissions projections until 2050. And one really important pillar was actually uh, monitoring. So we also like yearly, uh, we were monitoring yearly climate action and measures, and we were also doing the climate mirror. And then it's also we did a local scoreboard. This actually means that we went from the governmental uh, issues actually to the local and this was actually a tool for local municipalities to see where they actually are when it comes to to uh, measures, uh, uh, climate measures. And actually all of this was actually embedded with cooperation for common decisions. So decision support system was, uh, decision support was actually for planning uh, was also then established. And here what we will also like to separate is actually what was actually done within the Life Climate Path project. This is the under, uh, the, the, uh, the foundation of the house. And then we have the roof when it comes to decision maker for implementation of the Paris Agreement, because we also wanted to say where is the line, what actually the experts do, and when then it comes to the decision, make, uh, to decision makers, and when it comes to policies. So actually, what were the main projects? Result, just quickly, uh, we produce climate mirrors, three climate mirrors. We will hear about more in the afternoon. And then, as mentioned before, it was local scoreboard for municipalities. And there, of course, within the climate past 2050, we did a scenario analysis of greenhouse gas projections and including impact assessment. And this was actually used for long-term climate strategy in Slovenia. And it was also used for the national climate and energy plans and also national air pollution control program. So all these programs actually has, have as a base the same foundation, the same analytical analysis. And all along, actually, we had the coordination processes. It was also the process what, when it comes to climate paths, so this means when we were discussing the projections and also in the monitoring. So what actually results in coordination processes, what was the aim was actually increased use of analysis by policymakers, which we also stressed out today several times. Of course, it was also improved transparency of monitoring and accountability of the progress tracking. And what was also a really um, big aim for us was improved knowledge and accessibility of data. We really wanted to be transparent and also put everything 
uh, public so the public can see the experts and everyone has actually the accessibility of the data and also people at the ministries that could actually use our data and know what uh, the data and analysis are actually about. And of course, what was also a really big uh, part was to build stronger network of expert and dissemination on emission projection and monitoring. So actually between September 2017, when the project uh, kicked off, and September 2021, we had 35 workshops and three events. So these events uh, were more when the Climate Action Mural was released, and it, we also uh, attended quite a big audience. It was all, almost all, always like around 80 to 70 people uh, present, which is a lot for Slovenia, which has 2 million people. And also when it comes to workshops, we had four workshops that were actually focusing more on monitoring the mirror. But also I would like to stress out here that sometimes the, these workshops were actually mixed because we were also discussing the present issue the, 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 with the specific topic and then also how this can be then linked to 2050, the projections, how we see it, how, how, what are the potential. So actually I have here a bit old statistic which is uh, in the, from the mid-year 2020 because then COVID happened and it's hard to track them people on Zoom. Uh, who actually belongs to whom. But anyway, it's, uh, it was like that more than 1,070 people actually attended our workshops and events, which I think is really quite a success for Slovenian space. Uh, and it, we had actually more around 55 different people. So it's not like, of course, people were reoccurring because we were actually having a pool of experts and people at the ministries and NGOs. It was not like consultations with the general public. So the pool in Slovenia, it's not that big. So actually, but we had different people, as I said, from ministries, NGOs. We also, of course, included uh, companies, local energy. Uh, agencies and a lot more. So here you can see a few photos. Sometimes we were doing just presentation from the, the um, like a lecture way, but a lot of things were like interactive to actually really discuss and share the views and debate about the different topics. So if we go to the consultation of the, on the analysis, here uh, we can see the steps in the analysis of supporting long-term climate strategy. So before going to this, we actually had 10 workshops on potentials. Here I just named a few. Uh, it was, for instance, one on potential of shallow geothermal energy. Then you also have perspective of energy contracting and financial incentives, subsidies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the economy. Actually, sometimes even from the workshops that we had the new ideas, what needs to be discussed further came up. So was not, this was not prefixed, the, the topics of the, all, the whole workshops. We just have the idea, but sometimes this actually developed through the uh, through the progress and through the project. Uh, then if we go to the scoping of the analysis phase, this is like setting the criteria for comparison of scenario, the definition of scenarios, old, uh, and these kind of things. Actually, we had seven workshops. And here I would like to specifically mention the climate neutrality workshop or event, which was held uh, in Slovenia also together with Can Europe and also with the Ministry of uh, Environment and Special Planning. And um, actually we also borrowed the, the title from Weather to How, um, consultation about long-term strategy in Slovenia. And this was actually, I think, we think the first time that in Slovenian space, uh, we heard the word or the term climate neutrality. And we're actually starting to discuss what does it mean and how actually to achieve it. Or this was the first time that actually came up in Slovenia that until 2050 that uh, we can achieve or at least leaving towards uh, achieving the climate neutrality. Of course, we also have, for instance, this was the preparing of the long-term climate strategy. This was also done with the ministry when they they also presented, I think it was in 2019, the, the, what are their um, actually plans, uh, how they will proceed when it comes to uh, shaping the long-term climate strategy. So actually the, the topic started to roll around in Slovenia and space. Uh, then we also had three workshops uh, when it comes to projection of the external factors. We were discussing energy prices projections, projection of transport work and GDP projection, which uh, 
or also these workshops, for instance, were more in smaller groups with the expert because it was really, uh, it's, it, it was really challenging, especially, for instance, with the energy prices and the GDP projections, how actually, what can we expect in 2050 and how to model this. Uh, then it went to projection of greenhouse gas em emissions if we go to the step, uh, steps in the analysis. But anyway, at the end, we also had at uh, the stage five, when it says developing recommendation, we also then held 10 workshops on results. Uh, what actually we did in the, the analysis and these workshops were also when the climate strategy of Slovenia was still not accepted and also in the public consultation in that time. So there was still time and space to, to, to discuss the, the results, to discuss the scenarios and to, to just present. And also it depends. In these workshops, sometimes we were presenting it also to the general public. We were also trying to present it to actually the politicians. And then also, for instance, one, one were just, for instance, for modeling, uh, for modelers. So it was more technical to actually explain the models behind it, be, explain more the science behind it. So it was actually, all the time, we had to think about who is our public actually and how to address the issue and how to present the work and what do we actually want to discuss in our workshops. Uh, so perhaps, uh, this was actually in consultation, so I guess a lot of you may be wondering how this, what were actually the results of this, what actually happened on the consultation and with the background analysis. Well, actually also Slovenia was a bit late, but uh, the long-term climate strategy was actually adopted by the government in 2021, so it's just a few months old. And as I mentioned before, the long-term climate strategy of Slovenia and National Energy and Climate Plan, which we consider as an action plan of the strategy, were harmonized, which I would like to stress out again. I think it's really, uh, it's a good achievement actually that we always, all the time have the same analysis, the same basis that it's not different, um, uh, different uh, methodology behind it or everything that we actually understand how these two documents were built. And this is just briefly for those of you who are not familiar before I go into the, just briefly to talk about scenarios that in Slovenia transport is actually the main uh, uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions, which is actually followed by the uh, ele production of electrical energy and heat. So as mentioned before, the projections and analytical analysis were, were used as a base for Slovenia long-term climate strategy where the goal was actually to achieve climate neutrality. So what we did with our uh, background analysis, we also did, I have to stress out that we did several scenarios, of course, with existing measures, and then it was with existing measures, uh, with additional measures and additional measures more uh, ambitious. And at the same time, I would like to stress that when talking, uh, when we were doing also these scenarios, we also all the time took into account the sectoral goals. So for instance, like uh, food security, that we didn't, let's say, overrun these goals. So these goals were all the time like taking into the scenarios. And actually two scenarios show that we can achieve climate neutrality. And this is uh, on one side, we see the graph and this then how this actually was reflected in the document. Uh, so it was in the table and it says uh, the climate neutrality. So at this point, I would like to also stress out that actually, uh, yes, it's a result that these uh, results were used also when uh, shaping the, for the long-term climate strategy, but also that uh, it was the circumstances that actually Josef Stefan Institutes or our institute together with different partners actually also shaped the first draft or the draft or the long-term climate strategy. So actually we had the really good overview into what is in analytical analysis and then also what, how to actually draft the text for the long-term climate strategy for Slovenia. So lessons learned actually from this long uh, consultation process, it actually took uh, four years, that also that for the climate energy, National Energy and Climate Plan, which started um, after we started actually live project, that we, we, we got the feedback that actually also, because it was also prepared at our institute with a different consortium actually, that they, the, they took this, uh, the basis or the, the work on the foundation that we actually started with these good coordination processes with it within the life climate path, because we actually connected a lot of different experts, as I said, from universities, from companies, from uh, different ministries, different uh, national agencies, so actually that we already had a base to work with. 
uh, as I also said, that we then, uh, Jose Stefan Institute, together with partners, shaped the long-term climate strategy from Slovenian ministry. And there was also some public consultation and, work, uh, and uh, workshops uh, during the public consultations. Uh, we also came into to, to this line that I was talking about, where is actually then the line between uh, expert work and political decisions. So I think in a small country, as Slovenia is and several other countries, this can then sometimes be a bit mixed or people are just overlapping or it's hard to find this really fine line. Um, what uh, also came in between, for instance, is just like perturbation, a small one, is the change of the government. So this also showed us, for instance, that you really have to be flexible, then the timelines are changing and perhaps even the approaches and you have to be prepared to explain again everything and to stress different priorities or to change some chapters, for instance, in the draft. So this also, for instance, happened and perhaps prolonged a bit the shaping of Slovenia long-term climate strategy, which we heard uh, today actually it's a live, uh, it's a live uh, document, so it also all the time has to be updated, but this can then, for instance, prolong it, and then when you finish it, then the new EU uh, um, recommendations or, uh, comes out like for, fifth for 55, and then you should change it again, but it just went through the parliament, so these are these, uh, I think, um, challenges. Uh, what also happened is actually COVID because we had uh, more or less our events uh, live, which was actually good to at least shape this, um, the good relationship between people. But unfortunately, then we also went online. It worked also fine, but still I think this touch uh, sometimes was missing. And uh, there were also a lot of possibility for future cooperation also among Slovenia that actually people were aware who's doing what, where can they find partners for any other uh, projects. So I think this also was a big uh, network that um, was established during the Life Climate Path. So as my end remark, I would like to say that we're going through major transformation. So to become climate neutral society in 2050. So everyone has to be on board and engagement of all layers and sectors is necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Katarina. Uh, there is one question, but I will direct this question to Ms. Andrea Urbancic, and the question is, how is the future power generator's capacity mix determined for different scenarios, model internally or externally? And I will ask Ms. Uh, Urbancic to, to answer the question, please. Um, yeah, we will have opportunity tomorrow to speak more about energy sectors, uh, but... Uh, uh, it was uh, modeled uh, by a set of models, uh, so uh, it was actually it was uh, modeled internally. Is, uh, the answer, but the external uh, input are uh, international uh, energy prices. This was external. Thank you very much for uh, the answer. Uh, by now, I will conclude uh, the session uh, which we had uh, this morning, how ambitions are the long-term climate strategies. Uh, we will have a coffee break, and during this coffee break, there will be the networking uh, going on. You have uh, information and instructions on this uh, on in the chat section. Uh, we have two so-called breakout rooms. One is our small countries specific, and the other one is comparison of long-term strategy progress in Visegrad group. Uh, those uh, breakout rooms will be moderated by two of our colleagues, and you are invited to join to these breakout rooms by clicking at the bottom of the screen. Of the screen. And we'll have these breakout rooms for approximately 20 to 25 minutes. And uh, after that, we'll have a uh, break until 12, and we'll continue with the round table at 12 o'clock.
continue with the round table, aligning short-term climate actions with long-term climate goals. Prior to round table, we will start again the Mentimeter. Can you please uh, go to Dementi.com and use the code 16930362 or click to the link which is on your right hand site in the, in the chat section. We also have two questions as before. And the first question is, in which sectors do you see the largest potential for additional greenhouse gas reduction until 2030 to achieve fit for 55? You can uh, rate all of the uh, mentioned entries. Do we have it on the screen? Apparently we're not receiving the the answers. Okay, we are receiving the votes. Again, in which sectors do you see the largest potential for additional greenhouse gas reduction until 2030 to achieve fit for 55? We know that uh, everybody has already decided on, uh, on goals, but these goals were lower than fit for 55. And this is the reason why we are asking this question, where can you find additional potentials? And this is very important because the legislation and both the implementation should go in the direction to reduce as much as possible. We have some technical difficulties with sound. Uh, I hope we will have this resolved shortly. We got information that the sound is on now. Again, this is the Mentimeter, uh, menti.com. You can use either the code or you link to the right hand side of the chat section. And the first question is in which sectors do you see the largest potential for additional greenhouse gas reduction until 2030 to achieve fit for 55? So far we have only 15 votes. I would invite everybody to submit their votes. You can jo the, join the voting uh, by clicking to the right hand side of the chat section to the link to menti.com or you can use the code 16930362 menti.com. We see that the transport is on the first place, second place for power generation and industry is quite uh, similar to the power generation. We have 27 votes so far, and we can see by far the largest potential is expected in the transport sector. And then we see some relative similar answer for power generation, industry buildings, energy supply, and again, a bit less in agriculture.
We'll have some 15 seconds more for your votes. The results are uh, quite <coughs> obvious. Transport, power generation, and uh, sectors who consume energy as the third the largest option. We'll go to the next question, which is assess from one to 10, how set strategic goals reflect in actual actions implementation. So what is your impression on how the strategic goals are reflected in actual implementation. You can select, you can, you can rate multiple sections or uh, multiple uh, rates. One is uh, bad or uh, there is no impact and there is no connection and tennis, it is very well connected uh, from strategic to implementation. After 30 votes, we are somehow on, on the lower side and somehow in some in, in the middle side. We should maybe also have the information which country is giving what notes to the to the score system. Apparently the majority of votes would be below uh, average or below five. We'll give another 15 seconds for, for voting. So based on 32 votes, uh, we have two typical representatives. One is on a low side, uh, on a low, uh, on, on a low side with rates two, three and the other one is around six. Uh, so we can see that there are some opinions which rate the implementation quite low and some which rate the implementation somewhere in the, in the middle. So we have <coughs> quite a task to move this curve to the right-hand side and to go from strategic goals into the actual implementation. And this is, uh, I will conclude now the, the votes. Thank you for your voting and we'll continue with the conference. Uh, we have now the round table aligning the short-term climate actions with long-term goals. We have invited uh, four speakers already and guests uh, to the round table discussion. Uh, we have Mr. Ayol de Groot uh, from Netherlands. Uh, Gwenael Podesta from Ministry of Ecological Transition from France, Ms. Gertrud Volansky from Austria, and Mr. Martin Batic from Ministry of Environment in Slovenia. Uh, <coughs> I have prepared a short uh, number of questions where I would like to start my discussion uh, with. And since uh, we had the presentation of the, of the colleagues who are members of the roundtable discussion, I would discussion I would ask uh, Mr. Podesta from France on his opinion how well the strategic documents in France are well prepared towards implementation. How good is France in translating goals into strategies and further into implementation? And I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Podesta. Thank you and thanks for giving me the floor and uh, thanks to the organizers. Um, yes, in France, we have quite a experience with the long-term strategy since our first long-term strategy was published back in 2015. And since then, we had a revision of the strategy with a new strategy published in 2020. Um, and now we're almost in the process of, again, uh, revising it. So uh, let's say it's an iterative process. And this, 
uh, circular process very much helped us to to get this uh, this uh, element into our political landscape. Uh, and just as an example, our first strategy, uh, when it was released, it pretty much remained as a very administrative document, uh, only uh, addressed by, let's say, ministries. Uh, and then in the, in the second strategy, where we uh, really much um, improved um, the, the participatory and inclusive process uh, in the elaboration of the strategy, uh, it helped a lot the strategy to become, let's say, a central reference for um, uh, various actors in the in, in the country. Uh, and for example, um, uh, we have various uh, industries that made uh, sectoral roadmaps, and uh, they took as a reference uh, the, the long term strategy and the, and the carbon budgets. Uh, and li likewise, we recently had a, a law a law on climate change, and at the parliament, every every time. Uh, uh, members of the parliament were asking, okay, but what's the reference in the, the lockdown strategy and where should we go, where should we be, and is the law enough uh, for to, to reach the goals set in the, the lockdown strategy? So it really much become of a central piece of our of our of our political landscape, and uh, I think this was very very much helped by the fact that we tried to during the elaboration process to involve a, a large variety of actors uh, uh, and. Uh, also, the, the fact that we both addressed the, the, the long term, let's say, of exploratory process in 2050 to get to know where we can get to carbon neutrality by 2050, and also the much more medium term, what policies and measures we need to address and implement to get to our short term goals. Uh, and the fact that the setting carbon budgets uh, also puts much more pressure on, on the current governments to, to reach the, the climate targets, and, and we do not push all the, the efforts, let's say, in the, in the long term. And having this sort of carbon budget also, yeah, uh, increases the pressure on our actors to, to to get to the where we we should be. I don't know how long I should speak, but <laughs> maybe I can. Yeah. Let's, let's stay here for now. Maybe maybe uh, additional question: How is France looking into Fit for 55, and what problems do you see in adopting these new uh, additional targets? So indeed, uh, this will be a, a central piece of the, the revision of the long-term strategy, since uh, our current strategy was uh, was based on our previous target of minus 40 percent uh, compared to to 19, 1990. Uh, so uh, right now we are, let's say, uh, considering the the Commission's proposals and uh, elaborating elaborating some first scenarios based on the, the proposals, but we don't know we don't know yet how it will end eventually after it uh, goes through the parliament and the council. So um, it's sure that we'll have to do more. And the question is how to address it between the different sectors. And this leads, will probably lead to very long discussions. Uh, for example, in the agricultural sector, uh, they consider that what they, what they um, committed to in the current strategy was the maximum they could do. Uh, but then other sectors will have to do much more. And we <clears throat> sort of have problem of how realistic is the is this? So we will have a uh, long discussions within the the revision of our strategy, which will start at the end of the year, uh, and we'll have a, a large number of uh, working groups uh, involving the different ministries and the stakeholders in that. Uh, so it will be, uh, yeah, a strong part of the revision. Uh, thank you. Maybe the question for Mr. Batic uh, from Slovenian perspective: What was the answer of Slovenia to the Fit for Fifty Five? discussion with the European Commission. Thank you for this question. Actually, uh, we are uh, running the presidency of the EU, so it's very difficult to comment on that. I know that during the, our presidency, we are trying to somehow, let's say, uh, put, forward, uh, put forward and uh, moving forward with this uh, Fit for 55 package. It's a big package which will actually uh, have an impact on all sectors and also on the society. So at the moment, uh, on the EU level, our, our goal is actually how to, to run this horizontal package as much as possible, let's say, coherent, coherently. Because there, uh, you, as you know, there is quite different le legislative acts inside from ATS, non-ATS and others which actually should be um, adapted, 
let's say, in a way uh, where the highest agreement will be achieved on the EU level, because it's very important. This will be translated into the national legislation, and in a natural le national legislation, there we have already the long-term strategies, which are very important. And uh, if I'm saying from the uh, Slovenian perspective, we actually uh, this year adapted the, uh, the uh, long-term strategy in the uh, form of a resolution. Uh, and actually through that, we are uh, somehow obliged to, to achieve uh, uh, climate neutrality up to 2050. So uh, this long-term strategy at the moment is aligned with uh, national, also with the national uh, energy and climate climate plan, which is very important, and should actually somehow uh, implement all actions which are envisaged on the on the uh, EU level and to be let's say to put in that way to be much more ambitious up to 2030 uh, thank you i am uh, uh, encouraging the audience from either from the uh, from the hall or from the uh, online uh, zoom session you can make uh, questions by raising uh, your hand uh, and uh, I have a question now for Mr. De Groot. I was trying to ask this before, uh, and I will put this now. You, you had the goal of 49% reduction until 2030 as one of the highest uh, uh, reduction percentages in Europe. How do you compare your current activities with the activities proposed by the Commission to fit for 55? So they are actually only increasing a little bit the number that you already decided to, to have as a, as a goal. And where do you see this comparison of your current uh, legislative and implementation process uh, compared to the EU, EU proposal? Um, that's a very good question. Um, our 49% um, goal is a national goal. And I think that, um, as also mentioned in my presentation, um, in the climate agreement, we have a very strong focus on emission reduction in ETS sectors. And uh, what we see from the Fit for 55 package is that um, the, uh, one of the great challenges for, for the Netherlands is also to increase um, the ambitions in the ESR sectors. Um, so we, we have to uh, uh, really uh, step up, up our effort. Um, it's not just... Um, uh, um, uh, you said in your question that it's um, uh, a couple of percentage points, but in reality, it's a lot of uh, effort. We really have to think about increasing the, the ESR effort, uh, uh, which translates to uh, quite a, a, a big increase in ambition for the Netherlands. And also in ETS, um, um, under the climate agreement, some national policies were introduced, uh, among which um, uh, CO2, le CO2 levy, uh, for industry in addition uh, to uh, ETS. Um, and um, one of the important questions is also uh, to, to uh, think about uh, the alignment between uh, this ambition and uh, 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 the new proposals by, uh, put forward by the Commission. Um, so I think that um, uh, while um, you might think it's just a couple of percentage points between 49 and 55, uh, it's really a, a great challenge also for the Netherlands to uh, to really uh, realign uh, the, um, uh, the the uh, our uh, strategy under the climate agreement uh, with um, the um, uh, strategy now proposed by uh, the Commission, um, and this is also an important um, message which was which was put forward by the study group that. Um, uh, uh, studied uh, the impact on on the the national strategy, uh, so we have a lot of lot of work uh, going forward. Okay, uh, thank you. Now uh, I would like to mention that uh, the questions I put on the screen before are now added to your chat section, so you can uh, take a look uh, at the at the chat site. 
uh, at, at the chat area. A question for uh, Austria, Ms. Wolanski. You mentioned that uh, your uh, strategy was quite well accepted by the uh, by the uh, residents of Austria, and. Uh, Maybe connecting uh, the first and the second question, uh, which I have put uh, on the screen. Uh, how how did you get this high percentage of positive uh, views of your uh, of Austrians towards the uh, the long term strategies for reducing uh, emissions, and how do you combine this into your strategic uh, process? Um, yeah, thank you. It's a very interesting question. Um, I think um, Richard said uh, in his presentation in the beginning um, that um, you need um, stakeholder support and the buy-in of, uh, of the civil society for any, um, any strategy that is more than paper. Um, and within um, limits set by, by time constraints, um, we did our best to um, involve uh, stakeholder groups and uh, including not only uh, the, the traditional stakeholders, um, but also um, new um, organizations uh, like uh, Fridays for Future. Uh, we also invited them to our workshops and, and we tried to um, to spread the message that um, this is um, this is something that uh, should um, concern everybody and, and is in, in the interest of everybody to um, to take the stance and and um, include their voices in the discussion. Um, so I. My, my conviction is that um, you need um, to spread the message um, and also to talk to those who may be skeptical um, and uh, point out um, that ambitious climate policy is not something to be afraid of. Um, it's something to... Um, to see as a chance for um, for more jobs, uh, for um, more competitiveness, um, for um, for a better um, for better livelihoods and and uh, circumstances of living uh, for um, for this uh, the population, the civil society. Um, that is a very ambitious um, aim. And uh, we have um, managed to include um, a small, very small percentage actually in the discussions, um, but we need uh, people to spread the message. And I think that's, uh, um, that's worth, uh, worth trying for. Um, and it, without that, um, policies will not be, um, be successful. Um, you need climate policies and measures um, that uh, are seen by the civil society as benefiting them. And, and I can mention one example. Um, uh, we recently decided, uh, the government decided on a um, so-called climate ticket um, that you can use in public transport in, in the whole of Austria. Um, for um, a very reasonable amount of money. Um, and if that is seen as climate uh, protection measures, as climate policies, uh, then um, I think it will take away a lot of the fears that stakeholders might have. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Now, I'm, I'm asking the audience uh, from the Zoom uh, participants, uh, are there any representatives of uh, any teams who are uh, who, who are partners uh, participating in the process of long-term strategies? Can you maybe comment for your country? I've seen there are people from uh, from Lithuania, uh, from Poland, from Latvia. Is there any opinion uh, on that and any comment uh, for the process which has been uh, developed in their countries? 
So you can raise the hand uh, if you can make a comment to that. If this is not the case, uh, I, I would give back uh, the floor to to Netherlands and to France. And my question would be, among the stakeholders, which stakeholders were, were very proactive and were very in favor of uh, these changes to uh, increase the the, uh, the climate goals, and which sectors were the worst or the one who were against? And maybe Mr. De Groer uh, first to to answer this. Um, well, if you look at the um, uh, stakeholder participation in the um, in the climate agreement, um, I think there was broad consensus on um, uh, on achieving the goals um, uh, in every sector. Um, but of course, there was a lot of discussion about how uh, uh, what's what's the right strategy. Uh, so specifically for the Netherlands, there was a strong focus by the cabinet on cost effectiveness, as I've laid out in my presentation. Um, uh, which was based in uh, uh, analysis by our, our environmental assessment agency. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about, is this the right approach to uh, really uh, uh, choose these um, uh, uh, cost-effective technologies or should we uh, prioritize other technologies? Um, and of course, um, what you, what you um, the dynamics at, at, at the different um, sector tables that we had uh, it was very different from sector to sector. So, for example, uh, the, 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 uh, the forum on uh, the electricity sector uh, um, uh, came from a, from a lot of experience from the energy agreement we had prior to the climate agreement. Uh, so there was already a lot of uh, work uh, done uh, and, 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 and a community was already uh, built to build uh, upon in the climate agreement. Um, uh, and in the industry sector, the dynamics were uh, wholly different from uh, uh, from uh, the round table. But I wouldn't I wouldn't make a distinction between. Uh, I think that that overall, and you also see this in um, uh, research uh, on um, support for climate policy uh, among the general public. That uh, uh, there's a majority. Uh, uh, is in favor of uh, of climate action, uh, but then of course when you um, when you really um, uh, start uh, developing policies and start thinking about the impact, then of course there's also there are all, all, there are also a lot of concerns, um, and especially in a small country such as the Netherlands, um, uh, the renewable energy, for example, it's, it, it requires space, more space than uh, fossil energy. And this is a big challenge for us. So when, um, uh, when uh, uh, solutions uh, become more specific and people start to think about the impacts, uh, they still support the goals, but there are also a lot of concerns about what, what does it mean for, uh, for my environment, for, for my uh, energy bills, etc. Uh, as it is in every country, I think. But um, I wouldn't uh, uh, point out uh, uh, a sector which was not in support or, or uh, of the climate goals, because there was broad support, but there was a lot of discussion, um, uh, differences in, in, in um, uh, well, the speed of consensus building, so to say, from table to table. So I think that uh, uh, industry, for example, uh, uh, more discussions at that table uh, than uh, between between different parties, because we also had uh, NGOs involved in the process. So we really uh, tried to uh, uh, combine all the different sides uh, at the table. Um, and uh, agriculture also a very uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, sector, I think. Um, uh, but if you talk about support for 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 the goals and 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 really the 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 idea that we have to take action, then I think that 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 this was there was consensus at all tables uh, for this. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there opinion from France on the on the same matter? Yes, yeah, sure. So, as I said earlier, our current strategy is based on the minus 40% targets and the revision of our strategy will only start in the end of the year. So we haven't had proper, let's say, discussions with the entire stakeholders on the on the on this issue uh, precisely yet. But what I can say is that so far, I think there is a pretty much a consensus in the French society on the fact that climate action needs to accelerate. And I wouldn't say that there are uh, oppositions. I would say that it's more like concerns and 
especially the fact that um, uh, it doesn't create distortions in terms of uh, trade or, or some things like this uh, are, are a concern for, for like um, firms and private sector. But I think the fact that it's in the, a European action and the, and the fact that it's, there will be European regulations on transportation and vehicles uh, on the ETS, I think this uh, addresses a lot of the, uh, of the concerns and also the, the carbon adjustment uh, mechanism uh, which uh, has been proposed by the Commission is also very important for the for, in France uh, because uh, we used to have more ambitious targets than the other uh, countries in the, in the EU, for example. And now it, I think there's a feeling that uh, everyone will catch up at the, at the same pace uh, with the Fit for 55. And this is very important, I think, for uh, most of our stakeholders. Uh, thank you. Uh, my next question would be addressed to, to all of the speakers, uh, maybe more to uh, Austria and, and Slovenia, since uh, you're not uh, so much in discussion. The question about the recovery and resilience program. This is quite a new program which has uh, came up uh, because of the, uh, of the situation right now. And the question is, are those goals uh, already somehow reflected in recovering resilience programs which are currently under already under consideration by the member states how to uh, how to use these funds uh, in, in in the economy in in your society miss volansky um i have to confess this is not my um special area of expertise but as far as i am aware um our um, plan uh, does cover um, climate concerns and um, a lot of, um, of climate-related uh, policies and measures um, are um, integrated uh, into, um, into that plan. Okay, thank you. Mr. Batic? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. I think it's very, very important if, it, if it's actually uh you are asking if resilience set is uh embedded also in in actually in this uh way of transition to uh, climate neutrality yes i think uh, at least in our uh, uh long term strategy somehow put forward or also question of, of uh, vulnerable groups which we said in, in the long-term strategy that uh, we should be able to take also actions to mitigate and adapt to climate change for, for vulnera vulnerable groups. So I think that there is some how or we, sh we will try or we should try to find some how of balance because there is a, a threat of, of, let's say, mobility poverty and and electricity poverty. So uh, we should take into account also these aspects of society because otherwise if the society and what was already mentioned from colleagues from Netherlands and I, I understood also in France, the, the, uh, these resilience plans and, and, and uh, let's say and uh, funds which are, are related with that could help somehow to actually to be more resilient in, in, in achieving the uh, climate neutrality up to 2050. Thank you. Uh, when you were mentioning the, uh, the, uh, the groups that might be more vulnerable to, uh, to changes, uh, there's a question about the climate justice uh, in, in this case. How is climate justice uh, addressed in, in long-term strategies. Uh, we see that the energy prices went up by hundreds of percentage points uh, in, in the last couple of months, and uh, this will definitely uh, be a problem for some groups which will be again affected by the climate change strategies as well. And uh, I would like to make this question to, to Netherlands and to France again. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Maybe France first now. Yes, so indeed, this is a, a very critical issue. And I think it was seen uh, in France when we, we developed the strategies uh, and we, we systematically may, uh, assess the, the impacts on the, on the households and the per percentile of wealth. 
for example, uh, to see what the the how how it will impact the various uh, type of households. And uh, we were on the on the on the edge of uh, publishing the strategies. What the the yellow vest movement started um, due to the high prices of uh, of, of, of oil, um, and th that's that shows that how how important it is to sh to to show <coughs> a strategy. Sorry. <clears throat> that is uh, socially just and uh, that addresses the the various aspects of uh, of the just transition. Um, so since then we had a citizen convention on climate change, uh, with, uh, which uh, suggested uh, new measures that were uh, translated into a law that we passed very recently. And what was interesting with this uh, this convention is that they really much focused on aspects that we did not so much address in the long term strategy. For example, uh, regulate, regulating the advertisement uh, industry and uh, avoid, uh, let's say, to have too many um, um, signals uh, driving you to uh, making overconsumption, for example, of goods. This was very, a very strong aspect of the convention that we tried to, to, to translate into the law. And they also uh, highlighted the need to have to empower the citizens so to make them able to, to make their own choices without having government uh, let's say telling them to do what to do, for example, and this uh, has to be done, for example, through eco labeling to have a CO2 score on on, on, uh, on the products that they consume, for example, or through education as well. So this is was a very let's say innovative way of addressing uh, climate policies, and we will like try to do uh, to dig more into into this aspect in the revision of the future long term strategies. Uh, thank you, Mr. De Groer. Um, well, in the in the Netherlands, we also see increased intentions for uh, for this subject. Um, as a matter of fact, our social economic uh, council has a big conference on it today. Actually, uh, she also has uh, Diederik Soms almost as one of the guests uh, to talk specifically about uh, just transition. Um, what we see in the um, uh, in the policy discussion and also the the discussion um, uh, uh, the public discussion, there's there's. Uh, concern about um, uh, especially transition in the built environment and mobility um, and um, uh, its effect on uh, low income households. So uh, there's a lot of discussion about distributional concerns and also recently uh, the development of uh, gas prices um, is also uh, as in I think in many countries currently uh, uh, a very uh, important topic uh, specifically in the Netherlands. We um, we had uh, uh, historically we, we have been very dependent on uh, natural gas. Uh, the Groningen field in the northern northern part of the Netherlands was a big uh, 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 part of our energy supply. Um, and because of earthquakes in the northern part of the Netherlands, um, the um, uh, uh, the the northern field is actually the the Groningen field is actually closed. So this is increase increases our um, uh, our vulnerability also to this, these types of external shocks. And if you combine it with um, the, the climate strategy of um, increasing renewables um, uh, uh, with uh, increased intermittency uh, issues, issues, issues we, we see, um, there's a lot of uh, discussion currently about the impact on, uh, uh, on, on, on the energy prices and on uh, stability of the energy supply. So this is really uh, also in, in the recent discussion is also very, uh, uh, um, very uh, high on the agenda currently in the Netherlands. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions from the audience? Uh, then, then I would I would like to uh, make a question to Ms. Volansky. I would combine this question on uh, on climate justice with this: how the long-term energy and climate change strategies are integrated into other policies. Uh, we know that you said that being small sometimes also make, can make a difference, but also by is it by being small like Slovenia and Austria, is it then also easier to integrate such policies? on a wider uh, national scale and integrate energy and climate change strategies into other policies, or is this also quite hard to, to, to make? Uh, yeah, I, I don't really think it makes that much of a difference. Um, integrating uh, 
climate, mainstreaming climate into the whole um, political framework um, is always a challenge um, and it needs a lot of time and, and energy and persuasive powers um, to do it. Um, also to, um, to deal with the concerns about um, negative impacts of climate policies um, like the two colleagues just elaborated um, to, um, to also align social policies and health policies and so on um, with, uh, with the challenges of climate um, is, is absolutely key. And uh, it's a, I think it, we, we need to look beyond um, the obvious like um, energy, policies um, or, uh, or building um, or, or carbon sinks. Um, but this has to be a, a whole of society approach uh, in order to leave nobody behind. So as I said, it's not a question of size of the country. Um, as we see in Austria, um, we are a federal state uh, with nine, um, nine provinces. And uh, I think this is more of a challenge uh, than um, having a large um, one state approach um, because we need to not only align the federal policies and, and legislation, but also um, in, in many cases relevant to climate change, nine different um, um, legislations uh, in, in all of the, um, the provinces. Um, so um, I think this, this makes um, it more of a challenge um, than if you have a central government um, that can direct um, the course. Um, but uh, I mean, no matter what the challenge is, we need to work on that constantly and, and um, see that uh, we don't forget any area of, um, of life uh, and, and any area that is important to people, um, including the question of energy poverty. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Urbancic will make a question uh, and I will give her uh, the microphone. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. I have a question uh, to all of you. Uh, have you uh, any assessment uh, how the scenarios for, for long-term strategies will affect different income groups? Because our partners uh, in the Life Climate Project uh, uh, preparing macroeconomic analysis find out that the low-income groups will be uh, more affected uh, by different scenario and that the additional compensatory measures need to be implemented. And the other thing is, um, it's also a result and a question mark, uh, question um, from, from it, is that um, for 40% um, of household have no financial capacity uh, to get a loan to renovate their own buildings. That means that this uh, income distribution somehow affects uh, the implementation of targets. So also for the uh, matter of um, um, greenhouse gas reduction target, uh, this uh, equal distribution of income is very important. So uh, my question would be if you have any mm, assessment data on, on this uh, for your countries and also how do you think about uh, compensatory measures or additional measures in this area? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I would uh, ask Mr. De Greer to answer first and then France. Um, as we have in, um, in the Netherlands, our um, uh, Bureau for Economic Analysis, um, we have a very strong tradition of, of um, uh, not only on climate policy, but on every 
um, uh, new policy proposal that uh, the income effects are taken into account. So uh, our Bureau of, of Economic Analysis makes assessments of uh, new policy on the income of, of, uh, uh, of households, um, um, making a distinction between different um, uh, income groups. Um, and in the process uh, of the climate agreement, we also had an assessment uh, of the Bureau of Economic Analysis of the climate policies. Um, and there was a, a digressive effect. Um, so this led to a lot of uh, polit uh, political uh, discuss discussion on this about compensating measures. And then in response, uh, the government uh, implemented uh, some, of, some of these um, uh, measures that, that made the package overall more balanced uh, in um, uh, towards um, uh, low income households. So um, yes, we, we the, the short answer to your question is yes, we, we make assessments of um, policies on um, uh, on, on uh, uh, incomes. And um, I think that the uh, it's difficult to give an uh, answer about whether or not uh, climate policy uh, as such uh, has a um, degressive or, or effect or not. I think it, it depends really on what the specific um, policy mix is currently um, um, uh, within a country. And this, of course, uh, is very different from country to country. In the Netherlands, um, um, a very large um, um, uh, part of the, 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 the subsidy for renewable energy is financed through a, um, uh, uh, to, to give you an example, is financed through, through a surcharge on the energy bill. Um, and this um, has a, uh, as it's not financed through uh, the income tax, uh, this has a, a, a degressive effect. So if you uh, raise these taxes, then there will be a higher uh, effects for low income households. So we're really thinking about uh, addressing that and um, uh, with every new policy change. This is also uh, embedded in our climate law that um, uh, the government is also required to do this, uh, to make an assessment of uh, new policies on the uh, different uh, income groups. Uh, Mr. Pod Mr. Podesta for France, a short question, a short answer, please. Okay, very short. So yes, we, as I mentioned earlier, we do uh, systematically assess the, the distributional effects of, the, of our long-term strategies. And we had the same uh, conclusion as yours, which is that the, the poor households are more affected than the, the richer ones. Uh, on the, um, uh, building on this conclusion, uh, we, we created a new, a new policy, which we call the energy checks, which basically uh, is providing um, uh, checks to households in energy poverty to help them either to pay the bills directly or to finance renovations for their for their for their house. Um, so this was uh, created in 2016, and um, as time passes, it was uh, a lot enlarged and uh, and getting more significant in terms of uh, of, uh, of amount. Uh, so now it's uh, one of the our major tools to address this uh, this imp this uh, concern of uh, energy poverty. And we also have the, the issue of the carbon tax, which we're, right now is frozen at the, at the current level, um, which ha there has no, there hasn't been any decisions at the political level yet on whether it will uh, increase again or not. And I think this will be a, one of the major, let's say, um, uh, debates on our upcoming ele uh, presidential elections next year. Okay, uh, Mr. Batic, maybe a short answer for Slovenia. Uh, I think that we have no no uh, regular data re regarding that. At least I was aware, uh, I am aware of, but I think that there is quite quite important. Uh, at least, actually, uh, as colleague from Austria mentioned, I think it is very important to mainstream climate, uh, also climate justice, and and all these things also in other sectors and one of this is uh, low income uh, households households where we we should uh, take into account uh, possibility of energy poverty how we will solve that that uh, challenges in in much more let's say uh, comprehensive way but i have no no 
okay. you know, information that we and have. Ms. Volansky, your, uh, your comment on that, please. Um, yeah, um, we are going to have um, um, a carbon price uh, in Austria uh, starting by the middle of 22. Um, and of course, um, we are aware that um, low income households will be particularly affected by that, um, by that carbon price. Um, so in the package that the government has, uh, has agreed on um, only recently, um, also measures to support these low income households um, are foreseen. And um, Going beyond Austria, uh, we also have the discussions on the EU level about um, the extension of the um, emissions trading system uh, to buildings and, um, and transport. Um, and of course, uh, that would also mean that um, strong support for affected households would be needed. And, um, whether that is uh, through a social climate fund or by any other means, um, I think we, we can all agree that um, without supportive measures, um, this, um, this would not be an acceptable way to proceed uh, for uh, some parts of the population that we need to take care of. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question, uh, oh, we have, do we have a question? Uh, a raised hand? No, no. Uh, I, I would have an, another question on how the process of uh, preparation of the long-term strategies was held in your countries. Uh, was this a governmental driven with also a lot of work that has been done within the government or were there any independent research institutions involved? What was the process? Who was actually on the team, both on the on the side of the uh, of supporting uh, the, the governments uh, in preparation of the documents, maybe starting with France. Yes, thanks. So um, in France, the, the, the operation of the strategy is overseen by the government itself. So basically it's the Ministry of Environment which uh, coordinates the work, but it also involves other ministries. And I think this is very important for a strategy to be really much uh, government-wide and not just ministry-wide. Uh, so, for example, the Ministry of Agriculture oversees the revision of the um, agricultural sector modeling, uh, and the Minister of Finance is here in almost every every step of the way. Uh, this is uh, very helpful because now they, they they first they know what's going on in the strategy, and then they also have their own say, um, and they yeah they feel more um, enhances the appropriation. They set the strategy, and uh, in terms of stakeholders, so we have. Um, Two tracks, let's say one, one, one which is more political, uh, with uh, the the minister and then all the various stakeholders, private sector researchers, NGOs, um, uh, which uh, are gathered, let's say every th two or three months uh, during the revision of strategy. And then we have sort of a more technical track, which is uh, constituted of uh, working groups, um, sectoral work, sectoral working groups, which work more on the, uh, the policies and measure, the, the, the modeling, the assumptions uh, that we have. Um, and here we have uh, researchers, uh, think tanks, but also representative of the, of the private sector, which sometimes really are, we really are helpful to provide us with the data that we don't have ourselves, for example. And uh, I think it's very important that the, the strategies is owned by the government itself, because at some point you have to make decisions, uh, political choices, um, which an in, in, independent institution wouldn't have the legitimacy of doing, and uh, uh, yeah, it really helps to to then it helps during the implementation of the strategy by the, the government itself. Uh, thank you, Mr. De Groot for Netherlands. Um, as in the Netherlands, we have um, um, it's also the coordination uh, is within uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. So energy policy and climate policy are. Uh, together under one roof and the coordination of climate policy um, is done uh, uh, within um, uh, uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs and, and Climate Policy. And then um, the um, uh, climate policy is very much seen as a uh, shared responsibility also because of the issue raised earlier of uh, the importance of mainstreaming climate policy within uh, every aspect of, of government policy. 
Um, so we have a, a ministerial council uh, which, uh, cons which, which, uh, in which all uh, relevant ministries participate. Uh, for example, um, uh, the, ministry, the ministry that is responsible for infrastructure and mobility for the mobility side, uh, the minister, uh, ministry for agriculture for the agricultural side, etc. Um, so um, uh, this is the, the government side. Then um, the analytical work um, is done uh, 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 mainly by the uh, Environmental Assessment Agency, which is a um, government body, government agency, but it has uh, by law an independent status from the ministries. Uh, so this is very specific for the Dutch policy context. Uh, and the same status uh, applies to um, our uh, Bureau for Economic Analysis. So this is also an important player in in really doing the technical uh, analysis, for example, um, uh, uh, all the, the, the work uh, on the scenario side, um, uh, a lot of that is done by uh, uh, the, the Environmental Assessment Agency, PBL, in Netherlands. And then we have, uh, we have had uh, uh, the, the process I talked about earlier about the climate agreement, uh, which was really the process of um, um, uh, building societal consensus, uh, testing the assumptions with parties, and really uh, getting the feedback and input from all, all the all the parties within the sectors um, to to build uh, uh, yeah, societal consensus for for the policies and also uh, to build a community in, in, uh, that helps in implementing uh, policy. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Volansky. How is this coordinate, coordinated in Austria? Um, it, it was mostly um, within the government, the preparations um, with the um, Ministry of Climate Action in the lead. And uh, we uh, also um, got our data scenarios um, and, and modeling uh, from um, the um, Environment Agency and in collaboration with other think tanks. Um, and of course, we had the stakeholder process, but the, the writing and um, putting together the strategy was done in, in, uh, in our ministry. Uh, thank you. I will not make this question to Mr. Batish because I think it was uh, somehow discussed, but I will make the final question to uh, all of you. Uh, we need to be prepared for Fit, fit for 55. And... Uh, you may remember uh, the the graph on the Mentimeter where we asked what which sectors are uh, the ones where we can find additional opportunities and uh, the transport was the first one then the power sector and industry uh, were, were the second one maybe from your experience what is and, and from your uh, data on on in your countries what is the your final uh, comment on which sectors uh, might be the one where you could find or you could provide uh, these needed uh, improvements in, in our goals. And I will start with Mr. Batic now. Thank you very much for this question. I think it's it's really interesting. And probably for Slovenia, the most challenging, uh, challenging sector is transport that was already uh, mentioned in Mentimeter because there is, uh, as we should also know, that Slovenia is transition country. So it's we really uh, would uh, like to find solutions which which actually will reduce the the uh, the greenhouse gas emission in the in the future. And uh, therefore, we are seeking the the solutions there. Uh, probably there is also. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the challenges is is uh, also the the uh, trans transport from home to to work and that stuff what already let's say corona uh, pandemic shows that there can be done some work from from home office uh, quite efficiently and effective so i think that there is a really big 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 challenge the others, the other uh, uh, very challenging area is also renewables for Slovenia. Probably there is some, some let's say, 
some concerns and and uh, regarding or or uh, related with uh, as you know slovenia is very rich in biodiversity and with a lot of natura regions and we are covered uh, as was at the beginning measure 60 uh, percent with uh, forests so there are some challenges how to assure the sinks of co uh, co2 sinks and and other actually uh, things r related to it, uh, assure of uh, renewables in our country. So these are the main fields of really big challenges, and also industry as everywhere. But yeah, okay. thank uh, you, Miss Wolanski, Austria. Um, yeah, I also put transport on top of the list. Um, as uh, we have uh, also a lot of, of transit uh, transport in, in Austria. Um, and we have uh, some areas where um, public transport um, has to be improved um, so that people um, can start uh, using public transport instead of uh, their private uh, cars. Um, so it, it's a problem of both um, goods transport and um, and persons transport, um, and it has a really large uh, share in in our emissions. Uh, so this is the, I think, the first sector that needs to be um, in focus. Yes, uh, Mr. Podesta for France. I also put transport on the top of the list, uh, and I think the revision of the CO2, uh, the, the regulations on the CO2 emissions from vehicles will uh, be very helpful in, uh, in, in reaching, reaching that, but I think further action is also needed in other, other aspects. For example, uh, we, since compared to our previous, previous strategy, we saw that there was a large development of uh, hydrogen uh, in terms of uh, utilization by buses or trucks, and this is something we should uh, dig into more. Uh, to see where we can uh, achieve more emission reductions. Um, but I also put another sector in the, in, on top of the list, which is buildings. Uh, we do have a high ambitions already in terms of renovation, but I think we, there's also room to go further by uh, accelerating the, the change of um, energy systems uh, for heating. And uh, we have uh, the goals of um, uh, ending the heating by oil by uh, 2025, I think. So this is a very ambitious uh, goal that will, I think, help us to achieve more emission reductions in that sector. And, and I did put agriculture on the bottom of the list, but that's not that doesn't mean that they have they don't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah, I think all sectors will have to contribute, and agriculture is a difficult one. Uh, but I think we'd still need to have a reflection on how they can, uh, the sector can contribute, either in terms of uh, emissions from um, uh, mineral fertilizers. Or from uh, from um, uh, from cattle, and also energy emissions from agriculture, which is very often uh, underestimated and not so much addressed. Uh, thank you, and Mr. De Gruyere. Um, well, I think one of the main uh, um, uh, implications of, of Fit for Fifty Five is that we really need um, the potential in every sector to uh, we can't really afford to to make choices um, uh, because this has a direct effect on, on pathways to uh, climate neutrality. So we really have to address potential in every sector. Um, in, if you look at it from a, a European and global uh, uh, perspective, then I think that most, um, we are already on the way with, uh, uh, with the energy sector. Um, I think that uh, the great challenges lie ahead in, in um, uh, 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 especially industry and agriculture. Um, and I think that in every sector you see, if you look at the underlying potential in every sector, there's a, um, uh, you have cost-effective uh, policies that, um, that, that have a lot of potential and there are more expensive options. And there's also a difference between uh, options that are uh, maybe cost-effective, but still um, uh, have a lot of um, uh, societal uh, concerns. Uh, which we have to address. Uh, and I think this is the difficulty that um, we really need a strategy in every sector and we really have to move forward in every sector um, uh, because uh, the targets are that ambitious. So 
I think it's just a great challenge. And um, um, uh, um, if we purely look at it from a uh, cost-effective uh, perspective, then um, uh, the most cost-effective options are in um, uh, in industry, electricity, and mobility. But I think we uh, one of the implications of Fit for 55 is we really have to um, uh, make progress also with the more expensive options and and uh, uh, for example built environments just to uh, be able to uh, uh, make the transition in the built environment in a period uh, uh, from now until 2050 also from a practical uh, uh, purely practical standpoint to 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 be able to reach the target we have to really uh, start now also with more expensive options okay Thank you very much for, for your answers. Uh, with this, I would conclude uh, this roundtable. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of the participants uh, to the roundtable. Uh, we will be discussing uh, about models in tomorrow's session, and uh, tomorrow there will be an important question how to develop new models, which will be supporting the long-term strategies to even more uh, reduce the, the CO2 emissions. And uh, today afternoon we have a session on monitoring and evaluation, which is also important in order to get the real data on how successful the implementation of these strategic uh, goals is. Uh, I would like to thank uh, again all of you. Uh, we'll have now a lunch break. And during this break I would like uh, all participants to take a couple of minutes uh, to put your name on the map of participants. Uh, you can find information on the right hand uh, in the chat. This is used for the purposes of networking, for the purposes of uh, also networking after the conference. Uh, you can put your location, you can put your data uh, into it and we would like to uh, see also <coughs> what is actually the map of participants uh, coming to, to our conference. Uh, by this I would like to thank you again and uh, we have a uh, one hour break and we'll be back uh, at two o'clock with the session on how to enhance use of monitoring results for climate governance. Thank you.
Gentlemen, we will continue with the afternoon program. Uh, we have now uh, session number two, monitoring and evaluation for better implementation. We have three lectures prepared, and after these lectures, we will have a roundtable discussion. Uh, the monitoring and evaluation is an important part of preparation of any strategic document, uh, because when we design programs, implementation programs, and, and action plans based on strategic uh, on, on strategical documents, uh, we also need good evaluation and good monitoring so we can actually improve the strategic documents. Uh, we are in a process where uh, all national energy and climate change programs will be changed in a couple of years and uh, definitely monitoring and evaluation is important in the process of designing the new long-term strategies. I would like to invite uh, first uh, Ms. Barbara Petelin Visochnik from Energy Efficiency Center of Josef Stefan Institute for her first lecture with the title The Climate Action Mirror and the Local Climate Action Scoreboard. Um, <clears throat> hello to all also from my side and thanks to Marsh for the introduction. As uh, already uh, said, I'm going to talk today about the Climate Action Mirror and the Local Climate Action Scoreboard. Um, uh, so these are actually the two main elements of the Climate Action's monitoring system that we uh, were working uh, on uh, within the Life Climate Path 2050 project. Uh, the uh, Climate Action Mirror was actually designed to monitor the implementation of climate actions on the national level. And very important part of this uh, mirror are recommendations which, were, uh, which are prepared for decision making and thus supporting the design of short term uh, corrective actions. And then the second main element of this monitoring system is the local uh, climate action scoreboard. Uh, this is actually kind of web applica uh, um, application for municipalities and it's meant for more monitoring the uh, climate activities and the, their progress on the local level. Main objectives of this monitoring system uh, are of course to ensure appropriate information, that to improve the access to that information and also to implement a plan, do check and act cycle uh, for short-term corrective um, actions. Uh, the, first, I will talk about the Climate Action Mirror, uh, which, is, uh, which we developed on the national level. It consists of uh, some uh, different elements. And uh, first, in the first part of the mirror, we evaluate the compliance with targets the Slovenia has set. Uh, according to the effort sharing decision, according to the energy efficiency directive, and according to the energy um, uh, renewable energy directive. And so actually we gathered within this uh, system the information on progress towards those targets in one place, and uh, thus we have kind of streamlined the climate-related monitoring uh, regarding the two uh, regarding the two out of five uh, dimensions of the Slovenian National Energy and Climate Plan in one system. Uh, besides these main um, indicators, which are meant to monitor um, GHGD emissions in non-ETS sector and uh, energy efficiency and the share of re renewables, uh, we also developed sectoral progress tracking indicators the main aim of these indicators is to indicate the stronger and weaker points of climate actions in particular uh, sectors and as already said support the design of short-term corrective actions and also to provide specific guidelines for mid and long-term planning and here to the right you can see the example of one of those uh, um, um, indicators for the building sector uh, here we are looking at the cumulative floor area of energy renovated buildings in the public sector. And you can see that in the period from 2015 to 2017, there was almost no activity. 
in this area because we had this transition, transition from uh, one fin financial perspective to another uh, and there, were no, there was no activities. At the moment, we have 29 sectoral progress tracking indicators uh, plus additional four for UETS sector. Uh, all indicators are available also on, online. Um, Slovene uh, whole versions and in English you can find the key messages and the graphs available also in English language. Uh, here is also an example of how the summary of those sectoral indicators looks like. Uh, here is an example for the transport where you can see that uh, achieve, uh, we are um, regarding achievement of indicative annual targets. Uh, we are not doing that well because uh, mostly uh, things are colored red. Besides the uh, quantitative um, indicators, we included in the climate action mirror also qualitative overviews of the implementation of measures. Why we did that? Because some of the measures that, that cannot be assigned uh, uh, um, quantitative impacts. Uh, however, if we, we, if we didn't uh, implement, implement these uh, measures, this, uh, this would hinder the implementation of other measures or also the achievement of, of targets in the long term. Uh, now we have almost 100 climate mitigation measures uh, from different sectors and implemented by 14 different ministries and institutions that uh, we prepared the catalog forms for them. And the important impacts of these qualitative overviews are definitely that the data that we collect, um, uh, the information and data that we collect, that they are revised and um, evaluate by sectoral expert, for example, for, from also from the Agricultural Institute of Slovenia and from Slovenian Forestry Institu Institute, and that we include, um, we are trying to include people who are uh, responsible for the implementation of these measure, measures into, into the system and to cooperate with them. And also, very important part of this qualitative overviews are already mentioned recommendations for decision makers. Uh, another element of the climate mirror is uh, also the overview of the funds which are used to finance climate mitigation measures. Um, uh, here we can see to the right the graph from, from the this year's actually um, the climate mirror, uh, where you can see uh, that actually, um, if we would like to have evenly distributed investments, that we need constantly available incentives. And in year 2020, we uh, approximately good 80 million of incentives were paid to trigger around 350. Uh, million investments in energy efficiency <coughs> and uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, the last but not least, we included also in the mirror measures in focus, uh, nine altogether. These are measures that we made for them a kind of more detailed analysis because uh, of their underachievement in terms or, or of expected effects or implementation dynamics. And uh, we held uh, many uh, <clears throat> also workshops on different topics and actually got quite significant response uh, for certain measures, for example, for energy poverty, electric mobility, also district heating and energy renovation of uh, governmental buildings. Um, and uh, to conclude this part of, the, uh, of my presentation, uh, we had, I think that it was a good point, uh, good point that we developed this mirror in three annual cycle because this was kind of learning uh, process and we got very valuable um, feedback uh, every year from, from different stakeholders so, so we could improve the mirror. 
Uh, then it was prepared in close consultations with different stakeholders and including a wide uh, network of experts. And actually we would like to encourage with the climate action mirror policy makers to use the, the available information um, and the results more when they are uh, tracking the progress of the measures implementation. Um, uh, and we see the recommendation as a kind of um, a way to implement this PDCA cycle. Um, here uh, I have written that really active participation of uh, stakeholders is essential in, in our eyes. Uh, as we can see, uh, this is very difficult because it's, um, uh, there are not uh, enough of people working on climate change in Slovenia, in our it's our opinion at the moment, and also the organization, uh, uh, how they are organized. Uh, because this is a topic that goes uh, beyond one ministry, but includes all the, uh, all the ministries actually, uh, that it's really, um, it's really difficult to make this um, step from just monitoring and reporting on the climate actions to, to this act um, step, which would mean that, would really, that we would really use the recommendations prepared to um, to change uh, the um, measures uh, we are implementing to the better. Uh, we see this monitor as a good basis for climate-related monitoring under the um, Slovenian uh, National Energy and Climate Plan. And I have to say that Climate Action Mirror has already begun its uh, afterlife. A week ago, uh, the Climate Action Mirror 2021 was published. And in this mirror, we again, as already Ms. Wolanski said today, uh, we are um, putting forward, it's really important that climate change, it's put, uh, should be put into the political development and uh, implementation among those priorities. Uh, and that the action should be taken uh, uh, at once. And also the next year, uh, the Climate Action Mirror 2022 will follow. Uh, the second part is the local um, climate action scoreboard. As we all know, we think global, but we have to act local. Uh, this is uh, the web application uh, within we have 54 indicators from different uh, from eight sectors for example from buildings transport agriculture uh, waste industry and so on uh, 45 of those indicators they are prepared uh, for all municipalities because they are based on statistical data and the rest nine uh, they are prepared only for the uh, community, communities that joined the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. uh, those are 72 uh, communities at the, uh, at the moment, which cover approximately 43% of the Slovenian population. And in the um, scoreboard at the moment, uh, more than 60,000 data points are included. Uh, the data which are available within the scoreboard they are presented in different ways we can look at them in maps and maps or in graphs or in tables and actually scoreboard pro, um, enables municipalities to track their own progress uh, to make the comparisons with other municipalities also to highlight their own example of back, back practices and also uh, it's possible to access and export the data to make uh, uh, own analysis. And uh, now the conclusions for the scoreboard. Um, I think it's very important that the data which, were, which are usually only available on the national level are now also av available on the uh, local level. Uh, because that's, uh, that way they are accessible and useful also for the municipalities. Uh, and thus, they support municipalities also in monitoring their climate activities and the, and the progress of their activities um, by providing the information on the current status and on the trends 
Uh, this can be also used for more, for better local planning. We also we already know that some municipalities have used this data for the preparation of local energy uh, concepts and also of SICAPs. Uh, it can also be used uh, as a basis for the exchange of ideas and experiences because, for example, if you see on the map that uh, comparable municipality is really doing good in, I don't know, in uh, waste treatment, you can always uh, establish the link and uh, ask how they are doing that. Um, and it's, of course, also the tool that encourages municipalities for the implementation of climate activities and monitoring of measures. Um, this is uh, only, um, uh, there were some more activities with this, within this uh, activity of the, uh, this project, but I think these are uh, the most important um, uh, outcomes uh, regarding the monitoring and uh, report uh, about uh, and reporting on the uh, implementation of climate actions. So that would be uh, all from my side and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I would like to make a question. Uh, your comparison between the first uh, monitor, uh, the first uh, mirror, and the uh, last mirror. What, what what is the what is the lessons learned, and uh, w how many problems did you have at the beginning, and what problems are you facing now after a couple of years of pre preparing these documents? Um, the first, uh, we we have involved uh, evolved uh, m made quite uh, evaluate. Um, it's not evaluation, it's evolution, <laughs> evolution of the mirror uh, in these years. Uh, I think that uh, it's very important, for example, one that we included LULUCF, which we didn't have before, that we developed also the indicators for this sector, even though it's not non-ETS uh, non sector, and actually that we developed these uh, catalog forums <laughs> Because in the first in the first mirror we had a kind of only a small table, which gave very limited um, information on the implementation. Now we have much more information, and also what what I think it was that we didn't include the recommendation the the way we ha we have them now. They were we discussed the the recommendations already with the stakeholders, but the, they were a kind of presented in an essay way, I say. I mean like in a, in, a, in a text, and now they are really structured and kind of presented who is the, who should be responsible for, for uh, to implement this recommendation and what's the, what's the basis for, for certain um, recommendation. And we also, um, that's one thing, um, and we also included, uh, last year, we also included the uh, targets in the area of energy efficiency and renewable energy sources, which, which were, before that, they were not included. There, there were only GG emissions in non-ETS sector. So it was every year something new. Mm. Yeah. Do, do we have any good practices based on our recommendations that something changed? Uh, I think that uh, quite some, <laughs> well, it's, di it's difficult because they are more, it's, n it's not only um, climate mirror that influences the certain situation, so it's difficult really to say, but I think it's uh, really one thing that energy poverty, which was uh, taken into focus in 2018, that actually has supported quite much the the implementation of zero or uh, zero 0500 project that it's uh, implemented by ECOFUND. Uh, for example, that um, also I think in the district heating uh, um, that were quite some steps forward also with this strategy and things so on. And also uh, these recommendations, for example, from this second uh, climate action mirror 
they were also taken into account when developing the measures for the National Energy and Climate Plan. Um, so. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any questions from the uh, audience, uh, and I would like to encourage you again uh, to do so. Uh, so thank you, Barbara, uh, for your presentation, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Martin Verdong from Netherlands Enterprise Agency for his presentation on tracking progress of climate and energy policies in the Netherlands. Uh, Mr. Verdong, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, that's good. And can you see my presentation on screen? Yes. Can you just, yeah, it's okay now. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is actually the first hybrid um, uh, meeting or, or conference uh, uh, of, of which I participate. Um, so mostly it's all online, so I'm curious how this uh, this works. Um, uh, well, I've been, I've been asked um, um, to give you an idea on how um, we set up our monitoring and evaluation uh, system in the Netherlands. Um, so I hope I hope it inspires. Uh, I from the previous uh, lecture I already saw some some good uh, or similar things uh, we do in the Netherlands as well. So uh, that looks uh, very promising. Um, but okay, let me. Uh, give you a short outline. First, I will go briefly into our national policy context and uh, then on the framework for monitoring and evaluations. Um, how this fits in the, the policy cycle or the, 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 the plan, uh, do, uh, check, act, uh, um, uh, act, check uh, cycle, uh, as you call it, um, and, and some reflections. <clears throat> uh, the the, well, the, ma the main um, framework at the moment or since 2019 is the National Climate Act, um, which uh, sets uh, uh, long-term, uh, medium-term uh, um, mitigation targets uh, for 2050, uh, 95% reduction. Uh, a fully CO2 neutral power production by 2050 and an intermediate target of uh, for, uh, 49 reduction um, and this last target is uh, well is, 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 is the, 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 the primary focus of the policies we are implementing uh, today in the Netherlands um, and, the, the targets are, are not entirely in line with the recently adopted uh, European climate law. Um, so uh, our government is preparing to, to update uh, our national uh, climate act. So it's in line with that law, uh, European law, aiming towards climate neutrality. Um, oh, one of the... Um, now, most important things of this act, uh, besides uh, having targets, and uh, it asks for the government to prepare a national climate plan. And the first plan was published in 2019, uh, to, uh, virtually at the same time um, with our final NECP uh, for the period up to 2030. Uh, and this plan must be updated at least each five uh, years. So that's also in line with the NECPs. Um, but yeah, how is this monitored? Uh, well, the Climate Act also says something about that. Um, um, first is that um, Projections must be made on greenhouse gas emissions and, and important uh, other important indicators and developments. Uh, this is done in the climate and energy outlook. Uh, I will give you some more details later, but it helps to well keep on track um, uh, the, the climate policies on track uh, with the targets. Um, 
there's a uh, climate policy brief made by the Minister uh, of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy, um, to, uh, which is sent to the Parliament uh, annually. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, it, basically it, it, uh, it reports on, on the, the progress of policy being implemented um, and expectations in meeting the targets um, and if needed, uh, announcement of adjustments or, or, or new policies. Um, and so, so the climate and energy outlook is, is uh, obviously uh, uh, the basis for, for the expectations in meeting the targets and for the progress um, of policy implementation, we have developed a climate policy monitor, which I'll show you a bit later on. Uh, furthermore, in the Act, also uh, the, the, the consultation of the Council of State is, uh, is provided for. Um, this is the highest uh, administrative court in the Netherlands, and it advises the government and parliament on, on new legislation. Um, so th this is uh, also something new. Um, uh, a new practice uh, for us. So they will review the draft climate action plan and the climate policy brief, but more from a legal uh, legal perspective. Um, beside the Climate Act, there are also other, uh, there's a more generic framework for um, policy evaluations, which do not only apply to climate policies, but well, any policy. Uh, the government uh, implements. Um, and there, the, there's a uh, government accounts act which uh, regulates uh, the, this this framework for evaluations. And well, it's basically meant to um, um, well, to, to, to uh, for uh, uh, to to make the the government accountable for for the public uh, spending. So spending is being reviewed. Um, uh, so it can be reviewed and be, can, can be controlled. Um, one of the institutions that that is, um, uh, uh, which is being set up for this purpose is the Court of Audit, um, which makes annual financial re uh, uh, reviews, financial reports from the government. Um, it also uh, reviews the budget control. Um, and also makes um, uh, evaluation of policies uh, on effectiveness and cost efficiency. Um, and there's within this act also an, um, a regulation of periodic evaluations um, so that every minister ministry um, evaluates its own policies after, well, usually about seven years. Um, on effectiveness, cost efficiency, and, and the coherency between policies. So uh, both the Climate Act and this generic framework uh, gives, uh, gives the legal basis uh, for, for all the monitoring uh, around climate policies uh, in the Netherlands. Um, to give you some idea, um, uh, how the, the, the reports on uh, um, what climate and energy look like. Uh, this is the uh, this is a, a main figure from the outlook. Um, and basically, it, it 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 makes projections for greenhouse gas emissions, for energy consumption, renewable energy, using well um, historical data um, and 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 modeling um, future trends based on expected economic developments, technological developments, fuel prices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and this is uh, being done each year by uh, an independent public agency. Uh, some of you might know them, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, uh, also known as, of, uh, abbreviated as PBL. And um, yeah, they, they make projections of both uh, current and, and planned policies. 
Um, and they make evaluations about distance to targets, um, uh, uncertainties, uh, um, uh, which, which are relevant for, for, uh, for attaining the targets. Um, well, oh yeah, um, we have this, uh, we are making this since uh, 2014 uh, and annually. So we have quite some uh, practice uh, in, in doing this and um, experience in doing this. Uh, a relatively new um, part of the of the monitoring puzzle is the climate policy monitor, and this is more, um, yeah, um, uh, intended to to monitor well the implementation of policies and and their results. Um, as the outlook was more focusing on future projections uh, of trends and, and, and not as much as on the, 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 the progress of policies themselves. Um, so uh, there are lots of indicators uh, for each sector and, um, and, and it's more on the, um, pol the, the actions that were agreed in, um, uh, in, 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 in the climate policy plan. Uh, whether those have been implemented um, and what results can be seen from new subsidy schemes uh, or, or, or other plans. Uh, we, yeah, we have several indicators, uh, two of them, two, two examples I show you uh, here on, on, the, on the right side of the screen. Um, so, we, so we can, can see a, a little bit more on what is being done um, um, based on, on the policies uh, that are in place. Um, and, oh yeah, well, some new developments. We, uh, for this year, we also, we implemented an online dashboard, even providing more indicators and more details. Uh, and we had an, a special, we have a special on energy, on the energy system. Um, in order to, well, to, to, to show the, the interrelationships between supply and demand and the need for infrastructure on, uh, on both national, but, but especially on regional and local level. And the idea, uh, I should, uh, uh, um, I'll explain a bit more about the idea behind behind this climate policy monitoring. Um, um, for most policies, climate policies, uh, it it can take uh, many years before an, uh, before a policy has an impact, which can be seen in the statistics of of of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so, planning an offshore wind farm. Um, may only have uh, an, an observable impact in the, the, the energy balance, uh, maybe a, a decade uh, ahead. Um, so if, if policymakers want to steer their, their policies uh, based on, on actual developments, it, well, uh, 10 years or, or five year, even five years, is, is far too late. So we try to give more, well, uh, real, no, near real time uh, feedback to policymakers uh, by monitoring on uh, a more detailed level, mo uh, four monitoring levels. Um, uh, one is our, our policy actions uh, being done, like um, um, preparing an, an, uh, an uh, an amendment for an act, for example. Um, and the second level is our financial resources or, or uh, is ca capacity available uh, to uh, the actors which need to do something. Um, how is the, the behavior of those target actors changing? Like, are they investing in new technologies or not? and uh, obviously the results of those policies, um, uh, like wind farms being, uh, being built or uh, EVs in, in, in the car park. 
so how does this all fit together uh, in the in the in the policy cycle? Um, and we start with with the planning national climate plan or the NECPs. Um, each plan as a monitoring plan. Um, and when the policy is being implemented, then obviously the, mon the monitoring also starts with their registration and controls, data collection, and this feeds into the climate policy monitor um, and, and the historical data is also being used in the outlook in order to calibrate our models. Um, and to look uh, how effective policies uh, uh, are in practice. Um, well, ex ante assessments of, of new policies, uh, if, if targets are not being uh, met in the projections, and that can result in, in new policies. And yeah, well, this is the, 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 the cycle to, to correct um, or to steer policies to, to keep on track meeting the targets. And be, beside the annual cycle, uh, there are well uh, uh, other um, monitoring and evaluations, um, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which also yeah, fit in, in nicely into the cycle, I think. Okay, to wrap up, um, some reflections. Um, well, in my view, benefits are, uh, it, 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 it stands on a strong legal framework. Um, um, and that, that, that makes sure also that the policymakers actually do something with, with the monitoring and evaluation um, and, and, uh, yeah, and, and have an impact on the, the, the policy cycle and new policies. Um, and that, as, that uh, is especially the case for the, for the outlook, uh, which is uh, always uh, a very uh, the, the policymakers are always very keen in looking at uh, or finding out the results uh, from that outlook. Um, and but but to help policymakers steering or adjusting their policies based on actual progress data, um, uh, yeah, we we monitor also the policy actions and their results, and not just impacts on greenhouse gases and energy, which takes too too long time to, to, to observe, um, if at all. Um, some challenges we face um, uh, is the inclusion of uh, scheduled policies in ex ante evaluations. Um, um, and that the scheduled policies are, well, you can consider them as planned policies, but which are not smart enough to be modeled uh, or to be incorporated in, in the modeling. Uh, so that results in, in, in an outlook which is usually under est underestimating the potential impact of, of the climate plan. Um, so yeah, that, that delays or, or, or frustrates a bit the, the feedback uh, of the outlook into, in, in the policy cycle. As policymakers can always say, well, uh, the outlook does not include uh, some new plans. Um, yeah, okay. And then we have to wait and see where, uh, for the next cycle. Uh, ex post evaluations are well not always easy to well, to to, uh, to integrate into the policy cycle. Um, most policies that. Uh, uh, um, have already changed or stopped when the evaluation takes place. So that, that's not always easy for policymakers to, to, uh, to incorporate findings of those evaluations. Um, and having uniform data on all monitoring levels, I mean, that's, that's an issue, always an issue for monitoring uh, professionals, I think, um, especially if you want to have a more uh, if you want to monitor also on the on the lower uh, levels um, monitoring levels like conditions key enabling conditions that that gives us some headaches uh, time to time um, uh, and also 
uh, striving for um, of being able to to use the monitoring data uh, for other purposes as well, uh, for air pollution, circular economy, etc. But it it requires some well some clear and structured and, and streamlined uh, data, which is not always uh, the case. So um, I hope this is clear. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that was my last slide. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, for your presentation. Uh, I will not make a question now because you will be joining us at the round table and uh, I guess there will be more uh, time to uh, to have in-depth uh, discussion about that. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Matthias Duve from Ecological Institute. Uh, he's the head of uh, climate at Ecological Institute uh, from Berlin. And he's also the coordinator of Climate Recon 2050 project, which is funded by European Climate Initiative, EUKI, from the German Ministry of Environment and also one of the co-organizers of this conference. Uh, he will be discussing the national climate governance in Europe. And uh, I would like Mr. Duve to start with his presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, I so uh, thoroughly wished I could actually be in the room um, and you know see the room and have an, enjoyed the breaks with you. I'm nevertheless really happy that you're doing this as a hybrid event. You know, it's a step towards you know coming back in person uh, with each other. Um, thank you also for everyone who is organizing. I'm indeed, as um, per my kind introduction. Um, um, happy that we um, actually are co-hosting uh, this event with Climate Recon 2050. We're very grateful for the support that we've received for the work under this project from the European Climate Initiative and the European Climate Foundation, and that we have such great partners of which Joseph Stefan Institute are now the first to be organizing a, a national event. And then, you know, so uh, nicely tied in and with all the force and uh, the analytical power of the Life Climate Pla Path 2050 project behind it. Um, my presentation is going to be somewhat, um, you know, taking a, a step back from the very practical hands-on presentations that we just heard from uh, Barbara and Martin, and I was very grateful for those. I thought they were excellent, um, and it's really uh, useful also for the likes of me, who's usually looking at things from a bird's eye European perspective, to actually see the details of a national system in operation. Um, I will try to as I said, take a step back, but come back to uh, progress monitoring in the end, which will hopefully uh, lead us then nicely into the uh, panel discussion. So I want to start off, and as I'm talking about national climate governance systems in Europe, um, it's useful to um, have a brief reminder of what we're actually talking about when we say, you know, governance. And here, just um, as, um, as some background, and for those of you who are looking for specifics afterwards, uh, that here are the references for the main uh, resources that I'm using uh, in this presentation with work done by us and partners, including ITRI in France for the European Environment Agency and the European Climate Foundation. Um, so what do we actually need climate governance for? You know, with climate governments, we include essentially, I would say all of the different topics that you're covering in the conference. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's about the, the systems that help us uh, organize climate policy making, the institutions, the different actors, the rules that guide their coordination and cooperation, the different vehicles for planning and reporting, uh, etc. And, you know, we, we need effective climate governance systems, uh, obviously, um, you know, ultimately to achieve uh, our goals and to have a higher chance, I would say, not a guarantee, obviously, that we're going to be successful and, and trigger the transformation towards climate neutrality and neg negative emissions beyond that. And the things that we need from the system for that is it should, um, to the extent possible, clarify who's actually doing what and uh, when and how often. Uh, the system should give you the ability to adopt policies that 
can do the job that are effective and efficient to achieve your goals. And the processes should also provide enough information uh, about how the system is working and what progress we're making. And obviously this is one of the elements where progress monitoring comes in. And then um, ideally the, also the governance system, you know, creates um, some predictability and reliability for all of the stakeholders that are involved that need to, um, you know, help make, uh, you know, climate policy effective and that are affected by it. And so they should also be included um, in the process. Uh, and ultimately, all of this is important because our policy systems are usually not equipped to deal with something as big and as long term as um, us facing um, uh, and getting a solution to the climate crisis, because we're used to operating in much shorter cycles in terms of elections and, um, you know, the needs to report progress. We're, we're looking at a few years into the future and not uh, 20 or 30. So that's a real challenge and an effective system can help us overcome that. So in terms of actually getting to some of the insights from our work in this context, one of the, the analysis that we've done is uh, checking what um, national climate laws in Europe, what, what elements they include and what best practices they show. And, and from that, in the context of the question of what, what's actually effective governance and climate governance, we see that these laws, which essentially are you know, legislation to, to provide all of the things that you need for effective governance, they include targets, so they give you a sense of direction. They also often include um, uh, specifics on developing strategies and specific policies uh, at regular intervals. Of course, they also include the progress monitoring. Um, and you know, we had uh, Martin speak to the Dutch Climate Act and mentioning that progress monitoring and, um, and a proper cycle for review of policies was clearly included there. Then um, several of these laws also include um, something on the institutional coordination. And essentially all of the ones that we analyzed also have this scientific advice um, uh, function and something on public participation. And uh, what we have done for, um, for analyzing um, the national climate governance system is we took you know, the information from the analysis that I just presented, but also these general considerations. And we developed a methodology for, um, you know, trying to assess uh, what governance systems um, look like right now. So we actually went and checked for 33 countries, which is all of the member countries of the European Environment Agency, plus the UK, how are they um, set up in terms of three essential qualities? And I don't want to go through the details here because ultimately you're only really interested in, in the results of the analysis. But um, just to say that this is the approach um, that we chose. So we have a quite detailed methodology and, and checked for the existence of certain mechanisms and their frequency and whether they were enshrined in law, et cetera. And the um, results of that exercise, and this is where I'm moving to the specific mapping, is uh, that we ended up with um, something that we tried to put into a picture, at least a picture, as you can see, of uh, you know, a map uh, of Europe. And we were, on the basis of this assessment, um, able to distinguish between three main categories, or rather tiers of uh, climate governance quality, I would say. So the, the lightest green, I hope that's coming across well enough over Zoom, the very light green is basically the countries that are um, have a baseline, minimum baseline of um, systems in place that are established largely actually through obligations under the United Nations or under EU law such as you know, the, the governance regulation was mentioned today, the NECPs, the long-term strategies, all of these are mandatory um, for every member state in the EU. EU. So you know, EU laws have actually established a minimum basis for climate governance for every member state in the EU. Then we have a, a second category, um, countries that are already going beyond that. They're establishing their own additional 
processes, also setting up um, additional institutions. And then as a third category, um, we have those that have very detailed uh, and more specific systems. And in that last category, we found that there are most of those countries, essentially, I think every one of them other than Lithuania had um, adopted a national climate framework law. So countries with the laws were the ones with the most specific governance um, systems. We do have uh, you know, the details in the report, but I don't wanna go through that now, um, obviously, but actually move on to expand on this uh, notion of um, a robust and more detailed national governance system is associated with national climate framework laws. So, uh, you know, the um, uh, analysis of the climate laws that I was uh, mentioning earlier um, um, showed, you know, the slightly different map and also very differently colored, I realized that, um, which uh, gives you as, as key insight that the majority of EU member states actually already have a national climate law or they're in the process of preparing one. Not all of them, especially some of the ones that have been around for a little longer, do at the moment already include a long-term dimension. But some of those are um, in the process of being revised. So I know that there are plans in Austria, for example, uh, to revise the, the national climate law and to do, introduce a long-term perspective. So, you know, I know that there were um, um, considerations in Slovenia um, 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 a while back to also adopt the national climate law. What one can clearly say is you would be in good company uh, in Europe if you were to do that. And what we can also um, uh, say from the, the earlier analysis is uh, you know, your, um, your governance system has a high chance of becoming more specific and more detailed and more robust if you're putting it into a, a legal framework. And the realization, I think, of that fact is also why we now have, you know, an e climate framework law also at the EU level. It's not exactly the same as the national laws, but there are some elements that are, are similar. Um, you know, it now applies, actually, it, it puts all of the targets uh, um, as binding obligations into EU law. And it has, for example, also um, a progress monitoring cycle that is new, that's additional. It's uh, every five years, a specific progress monitoring towards climate neutrality. It introduces several other new mechanisms. And so also actually adds one that changes how national governance systems uh, work, or at least it, um, I would say it provides an additional check on national climate policies. And that's again, every five years, there is going to be an assessment of the national policies by each member state. And it will, um, that assessment should conclude whether they are contributing sufficiently and are in line with climate neutrality, or whether there are policies at national level that are uh, in contradiction with that goal and are potentially making it harder for the EU to achieve that objective. And so, again, EU legislation determines or has a clear impact on national climate governance. So much for the importance of the laws. Now, uh, another um, mapping that we did, and I'm not going to show you an actual map this time, I promise, um, is that we did as part of this exercise for the um, uh, European Environment Agency an actual check on um, external advisory bodies in Europe on climate policy. And we found such dedicated, or actually I would say dedicated not, but we found um, advisory bodies that provide an input to climate policy making at the national level in almost every country that we analyzed. Uh, I think one could say for Slovenia, where we weren't able to identify such a body, that actually several of the functions that some of these different bodies um, take on is, for example, filled in Slovenia by the Joseph Stefan Institute. So, you know, we did exclude, I have to say, essentially existing research organizations such as, as UR1. These are basically all bodies that have been set up by government um, but are not necessarily filled with government representatives, but largely with external stakeholders. 
and are meant to provide an input into national policy making. And you know, this is a, again very colorful. What's hopefully giving you a more insight, a better insight into how these um, bodies are developing. That what we're seeing in terms of a, a, a mapping over time over um, which bodies are being added by countries that over the past you know, five to you know, 10 years, there's been a significant increase in those types of bodies that are dedicated to climate on the one hand. So specifically countries in Europe are putting in place advisory bodies on climate policy. And they are um, increasingly doing so in the form of independent scientific climate councils. So, and that is a lesson or actually a practice, a good practice, I would say, that's uh, been taken up also at the EU level where the EU climate law actually includes also the establishment of such a dedicated scientific and independent climate change advisory board at the EU level. These bodies don't all work in the same way. You know, we have these different categories here. Some are largely basically stakeholder engagement platforms. Others are these independent uh, scientific councils. We analyzed those a little for, um, in more detail and found some success factors and barriers. And I don't want to go into any detail here, but you know, just having an advisory body, of course, in and by itself doesn't really give you better climate policy. But uh, you know, the, among the success factors that we found is um, that um, clearly they have to um, actually have the resources to do their job. So especially if they're a scientific council, they need to have secretariat and research staff, and they need to give, be given the, the, the means of actually carrying out uh, their job. And they also need to have a specific role in the governance process. And this is maybe where I can link it to the two presentations before me, um, uh, because I think what you were describing, you know, both um, um, Barbara and Martin were showing, you know, annual uh, progress monitoring and, and annual reports on progress. And this is actually a function that um, in, in most cases, these independent scientific climate councils, they take that on. Under the, the Dutch Climate Act, it's actually the, the uh, PBL, uh, um, which is still a um, government-related agency that takes on that uh, role. Um, in Germany, it's called a, a Climate Expert Council on, on Climate. In uh, Slovenia, obviously, Joseph Stefan Institute takes on that, that job. But we find that um, um, in the cases where we have these independent councils, it is them who do an annual report. The Advantages, they're considered to be independent and outside of government. So they are an independent voice to speak to government and say, you're maybe not entirely on track here. But they can only do so if they have the resources to do this. And if, for example, the in part of the mandate is that the government needs to respond, because I think with any progress monitoring, there's a real risk that you, you have good additional information but actually it disappears into a nirvana um, of um, you know, white noise because nobody does anything with the information. Last point, um, I know I'm running out of time, is I said I'm going to bring it back to uh, progress monitoring because um, you know, we were able to do another piece of analysis that um, uh, conceived and, and supported financially or paid for by the European Climate Foundation that allowed us to think about how a progress measuring towards climate neutrality actually would look like. And I'm just going to say basically two sentences here that, um, you know, we came to the realization that uh, indeed you do need a different approach to measuring whether you're on track towards climate neutrality. You, you don't need just the headline um, indicators. You do need to figure out with your monitoring set, with your indicators, whether the underlying structural change towards decarbonization is actually happening. And uh, I have a feeling that um, um, there is more to talk about here with Martin, who um, mentioned, for example, that the um, Dutch system is looking at uh, enabling conditions, for example, and change in behavior. And it's exactly those types of things that I'm talking about uh, here. So we need. Um, a new and um, more developed indicator um, monitoring, indicator-based monitoring system to track progress towards the long-term and towards structural change. 
Um, and, uh, you know, this is actually something that to some extent the Commission should develop under the um, EU climate law, you know, the, such a progress should happen for the first time in 2023. So the uh, Commission needs to develop um, uh, a system in any case. And there also actually needs to be a template developed for member state reporting on their progress towards NECPs. So, you know, these things could well go together and um, um, such a new net zero indicator based um, uh, system could be applied in many places and could also uh, support member states in, in their development of policy and in their tracking of progress and reporting it to the EU level. I'm not going to go through my key messages again. I hope that key, key points were clear and I'm looking forward to expanding um, in the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthias, uh, for your presentation. Uh, now we'll have uh, time for round table and uh, I will be... Uh, I will have to go to the main podium. We will make another Mentimeter poll opinion. Uh, the title of uh, this roundtable is how to enhance the use of monitoring results for climate governance and uh, we have already uh, we have prepared uh, two questions for you as well uh, they will be also uh, visible at the chat section uh, the the code uh, is uh, 36798008 so menti.com and the code uh, do we have the link in the in the chat section yes we also have a link uh, in the chat uh, section i will start with uh, our first question which is on monitoring quality. We would like you to assess the monitoring quality by, okay. I hope you can all see uh, on, on the screen, the question on the monitoring quality. So please submit your opinion on each statement. Uh, on the left hand side is a strongly disagree, on the right hand side is strongly agree. And we have six opinions and we would like you to evaluate each of these opinions. Again, we are waiting for the results to be visible on the screen. The votes are coming in. Okay, you, uh, I was told you were given the wrong uh, uh, link. So, just a second, we'll make the, the right link for you. Anyway, you, you can also go through the webpage menti.com and uh, enter the code, which is on the top of the screen, 3679. 8008 Now you have the right link uh, on the on the chat section It should be uploaded now so we have six uh, opinions the first one is monitoring must be defined during strategy preparation. Monitoring can only be defined during implementation. We are satisfied with current level of implementation. 
We need to develop new tools to meter effectiveness of implementation. Monitoring can hardly be used to improve implementation on short scale. And monitoring has been successfully used to prepare potential improvements. We see a strong agree uh, agreeing with that monitoring should be defined during strategy preparation. And also most of the votes are not satisfied with current level of implementation monitoring. Based on 20 votes, almost 20 votes, we see that we need to develop new tools to meter effectiveness of implementation. And apparently, uh, defining the monitoring during the implementation uh, makes no real sense, and this has been discussed in, in previous presentations uh, by our colleagues that uh, all good uh, monitoring was actually developed during the strategic preparation. So based on your votes, uh, we see that the monitoring should be defined during strategy preparation. We need new tools and definitely we are not satisfied with the level of of the level of monitoring which we have right now. The next question is who has to be involved to get the best results in monitoring and evaluation of climate actions? And we have different stakeholders and I would ask you to rate the possible answers which you have on screen. So the possible answers are governments, local governments, sectors, independent national institutions, international institutions, NGOs. We have votes. Uh, in favor of governments, then independent national institutions, sectors, not on international institutions. Also NGOs and local governments have a slight impact to the monitoring. So basically we all agree that the best results can be achieved if governments and independent national institutions are those institutions who are involved in monitoring and evaluation of climate actions. Let's wait a couple of more seconds. And uh, I thank you for your votes. Now we will continue with our round table. I will uh, also give a couple of uh, bullet points to uh, think about and to prepare for the questions. The round table will be about enhancing the use of monitoring results for climate governance. Uh, we have invited uh, three uh, speakers. You already have met uh, Mr. Verdonk. Uh, Mr. Duve and uh, Matthias Cheson from Energy Efficiency Center at, Inst at Josef Stefan Institute has joined us uh, in, in the hall. And uh, my six uh, topics uh, which I will be using uh, to prepare for the question and for the discussion, you can also find in the chat uh, area of the Zoom, so you can also maybe have your opinion and uh, make your question. And uh, I would like to take uh, the opportunity to make the first question to all of the three uh, guests. Can you maybe describe some good practices in monitoring of this implementation which, and, and how they were used for this climate governance? And 
I would like to ask Mr. Chesson first on this uh, answer and then also our two other guests. Question. Um, well, first of all, I can say that uh, Life Climate Path Project was a good practice in Slovenia, uh, as was presented by Barbara. Um, the, the process of monitoring has been through the project has been greatly improved, and now we basically collect a lot of data um, through which we monitor what is the implementation of certain policies and measures, uh, we prepare indicators, we qualitatively monitor what has been done um, on the certain policies and measures, um, what is the government action and what is the action of other um, institutions that have to, uh, to do some work. Um, and basically we prepare, um, we think that we prepare, we prepared in this project quite um, clear and good um, guidance why, what needs to be improved um, and I think that um, the things that have have to be improved in the future is how um, the institutions that are um, impacted by our recommendations take that on board as has been mentioned in all the presentations um, today um, and that's what I would stress as, as a good practice um, um, in Slovenia. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the same question for, for Martin, uh, for the Netherlands. Some, maybe some good practices and maybe some uh, of the missing points uh, in, in, your, uh, in your monitoring process. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I think um, uh, that a good practice is that the, 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 the agency which is responsible for implementation of policies is strongly involved in, in, in the monitoring as well. So the, um, uh, so the implementing agency collects the, the relevant data uh, which is needed for the monitoring that, that uh, so, uh, so we can so the agency can also share this data which can be used for the monitoring and also can help to interpret uh, the data uh, not just sending a set of uh, of, of, uh, of numbers and tables but also um, knowing what is um, um, uh, what, what, what uh, stakeholders are uh, facing uh, in, or experiencing in uh, implementing uh, uh, measures for their own or making use of, of policy uh, instruments that can be really helpful information for policymakers to improve their policies. Um, and for what could, what could be done better um uh, in, in our case um uh, let me think um it's um well we, we um yeah what could be could be better is that um most policies have their own specific targets or objectives like a subsidy wants to uh, enhance investments in um, in 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 clean uh, uh, technologies, um, but uh, there is and and the um, the implementation of that that policy is is um, aimed towards yeah, uh, doing it uh, with the, the lowest cost and with the least administrative burden for, for the stakeholders, target groups. So that results in mo most, most of the times in, in data, which is not very easy to use in impact assessments. So we need, you, mostly you need more data than just implementing the measure itself. So that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Duve, uh, the question to you a bit uh, enhanced. Uh, you've been through different uh, types of monitoring uh, in European countries. 
Do you see any good practices that could be easily transferred to other countries with uh, a, a good impact for the monitoring? Mm. Uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, you know, I, I cannot basically claim that I have an overview over all of the existing national practices. But what I can say is from the um, climate framework laws that we analyzed that um, basically put these processes in place, uh, the, you know, the good ones are those that have you know, clearly every regular frequency, you know, annual cycles as described in, in both of the, the presentations here. I think that is a good practice to start with. We do have annual reporting under the UN and, and to the EEA, for example, of the data, but that's not the same thing as taking the, the national data, putting it into a report that specifically points out uh, you know, where there are maybe gaps uh, and where there are problems, and then also creating a moment in the national discourse uh, to talk about it. So, you know, you can send off your data to, uh, to Copenhagen, for example, it'll be published, uh, you know, in a progress reporting at the EU level. But the key thing is, you know, what happens with the information. It's important to have good information, but then the second thing, what happens thereafter. And so, you know, one role that the monitoring can play is it can create awareness and it create accountability of government for a lack of progress. And for that, the information needs to be visible and it needs to get some political attention. And so the good practice that I can point to from these laws is that um, in a number of countries, the reports are submitted to parliament. And, you know, in some cases, they then have specific debates on the basis of the progress report. So report submission to parliament is done, is, is, is also specified in the Danish law, in the Finnish law, in France, in Germany, in Spain, in Sweden, etc. So that's a, not just have the data, but send it to your public representatives and then talk about it. And then the additional one that I would still want to add is, in some of the systems and some of the laws, there's a specific trigger to say, if we don't have enough progress, then you know there needs to be, for example, an, an additional policy program. If I heard Martin correctly, that's basically also part of the Dutch system that you're revising policy on the basis of the information. That is not a given. You know, I can just say in Germany, before we had now our regular cycle um, and that action trigger, we were not making enough progress on our climate targets that we were proclaiming as you know being you know world uh, world world league leading climate targets but we weren't achieving them but nothing was happening in terms of additional policies because there wasn't a mandatory trigger to say okay progress is not good enough you need to do extra policies and and we have that now and hopefully that will trigger additional policies in say transport and buildings etc in the difficult sectors maybe i would like to uh, i would like to draw attention to uh, what has been done in one of the presentations that there is generic framework for monitoring of different policies in, in, in the member states. Uh, but there's always, always the question whether this generic framework is detailed enough. And my question now is, is the climate policy, should be this a uh, really detailed uh, evaluation and monitoring, or this can be really done in a scope of some generic frameworks? Maybe Mr. Ferdong, uh, your opinion on that. Yes, that's a, that's a good point. Um, uh, I refer to it uh, in my um, for, for what could be done better, um, because the gener generic framework um, mostly looks at the the effectiveness and and, and, the, and the cost effectiveness of uh, of policies, but in order to determine uh, its effectiveness, you you look. The evaluators look at the the objective of of a certain policy, which is uh, which can be quite specific, um, um, and to to have um, more um, um, uh, or more stables which emit uh, less uh, fine fine dust particles, uh, for example, um, and, and the generic framework um, pr makes it possible to evaluate uh, that policy on, on, on that target. 
but you need for for climate policy uh, uh, governance you need um, to know what the contribution of that policy is to climate um, in order to well um, as uh, to, to have uh, the, the bigger the, the complete picture uh, on whether all policies together uh, um, uh, contribute enough uh, to uh, to keep on track. Maybe, Mr. Chesson, can you comment on that, please? Um, yeah, I would also say that this is a good point. Um, um, I agree with Ma what Martin said, um, because basically I think that it is really important that we try to cover all the areas that are important uh, for the future for us um, because if we have certain policies that will cause us some headache in the future that then we have to be aware of that also now um, I don't know um, now we are talking um, very much about climate um, climate change and what how, what are we going to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions but I think that it is really important that we also think about the air pollutant emissions. Um, and we are talking um, about biomass. Um, and this is a solution for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. But we also have to have in mind that they, that can cause some problems regarding particulate matter. So when we set up the system for monitoring, I think that it is really important that we try to set the system that will cover also the needs for monitoring the effects on other areas and as was as was mentioned also in um, presentation of uh, i think that katerina um, when we were preparing projections we were trying to take into account also what are the effects on um, um, if, if there will be enough food um, in the future, uh, what, are, what is the mobility situation, it, if it will have good effect on that or not. I think that we have to somehow, uh, um, I don't know how, but somehow take that also into account when we are monitoring um, actions that are being done. Um, and I think that it is really important to do that and that we have some kind of um, a good national system um, and that we have, of course, um, a broad consensus um, in the government and in different ministries because in these areas, the cooperation between ministries is really important. Uh, I, I would uh, go further with the question on the uh, what is the level of monitoring? Uh, Mr. Duve, you are looking into European scale, na namely uh, you are looking into each uh, country, what is the, uh, the, the type of uh, climate monitoring uh, there? And uh, my question would be, uh, can, we, can we see what, what is the better approach, maybe the better approach today and what will be the better approach tomorrow on the level, uh, in, in the scope of the level of monitoring? Should, should we go from the bottom up or from the top down? What is the, the approach that we should be taking in, in this sense? That's a that's a very good question. Um, um, my initial reaction would be, you know, that of course most of the data, you know, comes from the country level. You know, it's the the source of the data gathering, and uh, you know, you um, you know have also got experience now with you know going to sub national and local level in uh, uh, in in Slovenia with. Uh, the specific dashboard that you showed and your, you know, your online <clears throat> a tool for that, that people can use uh, at the same time. I think it makes sense, you know, to have uh, for like a harmonized system of checking whether we are on track towards climate neutrality, that we have standards and harmonized standards for the information that are set at EU level. So we need, you know, a harmonized system where there are key indicators that are decided together at EU level, and they then need to be gathered um, at the national level. That doesn't mean that they fully determine what happens at the national level. You know, you can do more, you cannot do less, uh, you know, but uh, I think that's, um, that is what I would go for. 
you know, one would also need to consider, you know, what can um, the indicators be used for? They're not just something that you use for um, tracking progress, but I think that came out in your Mentimeta poll on the, the very first question being, you know, when do you develop the indicators? Uh, you know, actually, there was said, you know, we need them in strategy preparation process. You know, why why is that? To some extent, you could say, you know, you actually, your the models, the modeling that you use, they will give you information about your pathways and what you expect. And if you're trying for a certain development, for example, you're trying to have your power production go to zero emissions by, you know, 2035, then, you know, that gives you a pathway and basically you get an indi the indicator of uh, your carbon intensity of your power production. You know, you get values for, for, um, for measurements into the future. And so you can use that, those values as, as benchmarks for checking future progress. So, you know, you can use uh, indicators as, as benchmarks, you can use them to therefore also assess the quality of policies or the quality of, of strategies. And on that basis, again, I think you need to have a harmonized minimum standard, common standard at EU level. And then you, of course, need to have the ability and should be able to, um, you know, set your own nationally specific values and, and choose specific indicators um, in your own country. Yes, uh, Mr. Fedong, uh, I would maybe turn around a little bit the question. When you uh, prepare the strategy, strategies, you always take into account some top-down approaches like uh, economic activities of, of, of an individual country. But then on technology level, you normally would use also the bottom-up approach. And uh, can, can you maybe distinguish between the, the process of preparing the strategies and process of monitoring this from these both approaches? Yeah, th thank you for uh, for, for uh, making this an ex uh, making this an explicit question. Otherwise, I would have responded to Matthias uh, uh, on on this, uh, focusing on on this top down versus bottom up um, uh, issue. Uh, I think Matthias uh, mostly referred to top down uh, uh, data, um, but um, uh, being available on the national level, which is being aggregated to to, you, to the European level, uh, but what we are trying to do is is integrating. We're not saying we don't use uh, top down uh, uh, data, of course, but we want to make you better use of bottom up data, uh, because bottom up data gives you far more insight in 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 yeah w what is happening on on a local level. Uh, but also, uh, um, th that's our main focus. Um, what what is what is what are the results from single policies? Um, um, and th th that's bottom up data as well. But it can give you quite good insight in in uh, what is happening um, with with uh, uh, with stakeholders, how their uh, behavior is changing and. Um, and it comes with 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 its own problems, of course. Uh, if you want to aggregate bottom-up data to more regional level or national level, and you want to compare it with your national uh, statistics, then you run into problems, of course. But um, we 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 try to well uh, account for that as much as possible. Um, usually. We don't want to even try to 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 sum it all up, but in the cases we do, we want to do that, we um, uh, avoid uh, uh, duplications or uh, avoid double counting by really looking at uh, okay, we have two policy measures which actually contribute to the same uh, investment uh, decision, and then yeah, uh, by identifying. Um, um, uh, what project that that specifically is uh, on on a, on a specific location by a certain owner? We can um, separate. Uh, uh, we, we can remove the duplication. Uh, so, so so that is something um, 
uh, it's a bit tricky, but and it requires some detailed level of, of, of uh, monitoring. Um, and we also learned, found out if you want to aggregate the bottom-up data, then streamlining of definitions and classifications is it's, it's crucial. If you don't do that, then, well, it's, it's very hard to um, aggregate um, yeah, data from different data sources. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, my question to Mr. Chesson, uh, you are very much involved in preparation of models uh, used uh, for a strategic uh, uh, decisions. And uh, what what is the level of details in the models compared to the level of details for the monitoring of uh, the data which are then used in models or were used in models prior uh, to to implementation? So, so how can this data compare among each other? Uh, well, that's, that is a really good point and good question. Uh, well, basically the models, uh, if, if we compare it with the statistics that are available, um, are more detailed um, because we want to get a um, good look at all different specificities that are um, needed to reach certain targets um, and also to understand um, how the system will react. Um, but if these are if we talk um, on the statistics on the national level. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think that at least in Slovenia, we have some questions regarding the local level. How is that um, taken into account in models? I think that here we have some room for improvement um, because as was um, stressed um, also by uh, Martin, um, he said that local level is also very important and I also think that um, the local level is important since they have a lot of action that is going going on on, the, on that level um, and I think that this uh, will have to be taken more uh, in detail in, in the modeling. Okay, thank you and uh, I would now refer to, to the next question the are, are the projections that we have and are the uh, modeling uh, sufficiently calibrated with the monitoring result? Uh, what we find out uh, sometimes is that uh, there is no feedback loop to the, to the preparation of the models and to calibration of the models. And uh, on long term, this would definitely cause some problems. Uh, how, how is this tackled in Netherlands uh, in, in the scope of preparation of the strategies and monitoring this? Uh, okay, yeah, um, the, the, the outlook uh, that is being uh, prepared, um, um, well, usually starts with uh, calibrating the models on new statistical data. That, that's really the, one of the first things uh, the, the modelers do before they even think about implementing policy plans into the model um, uh, in order to, to be sure that well, uh, the model can replicate the, the, the past uh, uh, um, uh, re reliably enough. Um, so they collect data from national uh, uh, statistics uh, agencies on, on, on greenhouse gases, but, but mostly also on the on the activity levels. Like Matthias said, um, it is more, yeah, the, mo the models are usually a bit more detailed uh, more detailed than the actual policies or strategies themselves, um, as the modeling really needs to, um, yeah, um, model uh, uh, um, the underlying um, 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 yeah, factors that influence energy consumption, like activity levels or, or, or technologies being implemented. implemented. Uh, free riding behavior, um, all, all things like that. Um, yeah, so, so that's an important uh, part of, of the, the modeler's work and that's what they what they do um, in our case. 
Uh, Mr. Duve, uh, in your overview of the uh, approaches to, to the monitoring, can you observe maybe some uh, new developments? What I have in mind is uh, we are speaking a lot and we are expecting a lot from uh, new, new, I would say, uh, new type of uh, activities which are somehow similar to what we had before. But there is a lot of discussion about circular economy, behavioral changes. So these are somehow the uh, the, the aspects which have not been taken into account so far when deciding on uh, the monitoring of these activities. Do you see maybe these changes that there will be new uh, new monitoring uh, approaches in order to tackle also this, maybe I would say social impacts uh, of these uh, activities, maybe some uh, some integrated like circular economy does not only refer to energy efficiency, but also to material, to uh, waste and stuff like that. What is your opinion on that? So, uh, thank you for the excellent question. Uh, at least in the the concept that we developed for a progress measuring system that would allow you to actually track the structural change towards climate neutrality, we definitely included, uh, you know, some of these aspects uh, so that, uh, you know, because, um, for example, movement towards a circular economy is, you know, potential or key strategy, can be a key strategy to get towards uh uh, to God's climate neutrality and, you know, change business models and, and um, you know, change the way that supply chains are working and which actors are involved. And so including um, a means of tracking that kind of change, I think, is, is important going forward. And that's not, I, I don't know the details of what's happening, for example, under the circular economy, you know, strategy, etc. So th there may be things that are coming from that policy area at the EU level that I'm not aware of. Um, but I would imagine that, um, you know, at present, most national monitoring systems do not include these details. Um, one uh, other thing that I would say is um, um, at the EU level, and, you know, that's obviously my, my main perspective here, uh, there um, are developments and negotiations still ongoing on the eighth Environment Action Programme. And that is now going to have a more detailed uh, monitoring and transparency framework with a new set of indicators that the Commission has been consulting on right now. It should be adopted by the end of the year. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of information that's already being gathered on a variety of aspects um, um, related also to some of the additional points that, that you refer to. They are basically happening in different places. And so, you know, one, I think, important um, a service that, uh, for example, this new Eighth Environment Action Program can provide is actually, you know, integrate some of the existing systems and provide a more comprehensive overview. And for, you know, climate policy purposes, it could help integrate other sustainability dimensions and also maybe a social uh, component into uh, you know the the progress monitoring that's happening at um, uh, the on climate policy specifically this is already to some extent happening um, via the european semester by the way where also social and 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 labor related indicators are being combined with broader economic and also environmental and climate policy related indicators. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fardong, uh, if, if I again turn around a little bit this, uh, this question on uh, Dutch uh, government uh, has been supporting uh, circular economy for many years and uh, I still think that uh, there is no uh, concrete or uh, a simple uh, definition what this includes in terms of how this will help to the climate change. Uh, so my question is, do you, in, in Netherlands, ca can you measure like behavioral changes? Can we distinguish between a technology change or behavioral change when we are monitoring uh, these activities? In the future, we will definitely see that there is a need to improve also the behavioral changes uh, because we will not be able to uh, 
uh, achieve these uh, really strict and uh, and uh, strong goals uh, not to change our behavior but how can we measure this in terms of monitoring of the and the evaluation of the impacts okay uh, that's a tough question it's a little bit uh, out of the scope of my uh, working field which is mostly climate and energy but uh, like Matthias uh, uh, correctly says it it, it, it it shares some some similarities at least uh, when monitoring uh, the, the, the the changes or the structural underlying changes uh, that are needed um, and indeed social in, of indicators on, 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 on social uh, social issues or, or behavior, and technology developments are certainly um, uh, uh, relevant. Uh, but how to di distinguish? Um, um, well, um, yeah, I, I, I would say, um, yeah. Well, it's <laughs> it's 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 a difficult. Uh, at least we we you, you can you can monitor. Um, uh, technological change in the sense uh, of investments being done in certain technologies by certain uh, sectors or, 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 or other target groups. Um, so you, you know what what is changing on that in that sense, and behavioral change is is a little bit more difficult to 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 grasp i think uh, you need to specify what change uh, do you want to uh, to observe or or do you, what do you desire i mean we define uh, behavioral change in such a way that it also includes this decision making on investments so um, but but it's broader than that. I'm, um, so um, monitoring on on activities, acti the activity level. Uh, um, for example, um, the, the the model the, the modalities used for personal tra transport is an indicator for well behavior. I think. Um, yeah, you, you yeah, and, and yep. uh, those are examples, I think. Uh, but you re really have to think it out carefully uh, how it uh, all connects together. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my next question would be uh, targeted to the how well we are prepared for monitoring of national energy and climate plans. Uh, maybe Mr. Chesson, uh, you are involved in preparation of uh, this, and uh, are we are we well prepared, or is is there something missing? What we have, uh, what I have in mind, uh, currently we have these high energy prices, which would definitely change how strategic uh, implementation would would look like. So, uh, how well is this integrated in the monitoring, and how well we are equipped now? to monitor these uh, activities in the in the short future? Well, first of all, we have climate monitor. Um, this can present a good base on which we can build. Um, climate monitor is, of course, um, or was developed in to have um, covered what is implemented regarding operational plan for greenhouse gas reduction. But NECP, um, in NACP also climate um, action is an important part of um, and we all know that energy um, is an important source of emissions so basically climate monitor today covers a lot of areas that are included in NACP so I can say that this is a good base um, but of course some additional areas are covered in NACP like um, research and also um, some um, issues on markets and things like that. Um, and how will we monitor um, what is going on there? Um, that is a good question. Uh, I think that 
first of all, we get to get the ministry, the ministries on board to be aware that they have to monitor actions that, that are in the NSCP because we are still missing um, some actions on, on their side. Um, um, but I also think that um, I hope, well, at least I hope that they will not be um, waiting until the, the last uh, minutes to, to prepare that and they will, that we will have a good discussion how will we monitor um, implementation of NSCPs, um, especially in the situation, as you mentioned, Tomas, is today, because um, things are really uh, dynamic and things are really changing quickly. Uh, Mr. Verdon, can your opinion on this? Since you are very much involved in this uh, preparation and evaluation of the NECPs. Um, yeah. Um, we uh, are busy with um, of trying to, to identify the, uh, the gaps in, in our knowledge, um, uh, in our knowledge base on, on data we, we have. So we look at all the requirements, reporting requirements in the governance regulation, and then, well, just um, visit people, uh, email people, and, and uh, mostly from, from uh, implementing agencies, but uh, if needed also uh, uh, their, uh, the, the policymakers uh, 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 responsible for, for that, um, uh, for, for the indicator. Uh, um, and that, that Kind of works. Um, and for, for most indicators in NECP, we have data. Some some data is is is, is tricky. Mostly the cross cutting uh, um, data on investments, uh, for example. Um, um, we still have to work out how to how to um, tackle that. Um, but yeah, um, it. Yeah, we, we have a good cooperation with with the ministry, so I think we come quite far on energy prices in particular. Um, um, yeah, the Na national statistics agency collects data on on energy prices and, of course, also um, market uh, uh, um, tra traders um, or or. Um, um, uh, suppliers uh, for 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 gas and electricity uh, have have data, and we collect those um, as well and integrate it in 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 the monitoring. Um, but for NECP is is not really like uh, like M M Matthias uh, said. Um, NECP reporting is not really a good instrument, I think, to respond. Um, uh, for policymakers to respond to to, to actual developments, um, NECP is something you need to submit to to Brussels uh, each uh, two year two years. But it's um, uh, it, it is more the question of how to um, uh, 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 make use of 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 this this information being collected for the NECPs by the by the national policy makers uh, and, and an annual national monitoring uh, tool or report really helps uh, with that maybe a question to mr duve on the uh, european funds uh, and on the financial spending for uh, of, of of these funds uh, how to how to monitor the uh, the impact of these funds which are somehow used uh, to fight climate change uh, but then on the other hand also uh, we are expecting that the uh, by introducing the new fit for 55 legislation uh, there will be some restructuring of funds which will which might not be anymore on the national level uh, like for co2 tax for uh, for uh, petrol but on rather european level because of the introduction of ets for other sectors not only the current ets sectors uh, how do you see this uh, the the overview of the financial spending uh, in this sense mm. 
Um, I, I can speak to that very briefly, but if possible, I'd also reply, I'd like to reply to the NECP question, yeah, if that's sure. okay. Thank you. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll tackle briefly your, your, but your um, actual question. I, I'm not, I have to admit that I'm not an expert on the, um, all of the ways in which governments re, um, report on their uh, expenditure um, under the various ways in which relevant money is being distributed from the EU level to member states, because you need to include there, of course, you know, there's spending on the cap, there is cohesion funding, there are, you know, there's the, um, there will be the new just transition um, a fund that's spending money. Certainly, the, the one thing I, I can say a little bit about is on the recovery spending specifically, um, uh, because uh, here, you know, there is indeed also a monitoring system that's, uh, that's uh, been put in place. It obviously, it's actually quite elaborate, I think, you know, member states need to report to the commission twice a year, which I, I've hardly seen in, in other circumstances. Um, also, you know, I, I would imagine that on, on certain things, you don't get data twice a year at the national level. So this will be hard and, uh, you know, requires even more work. Um, but the key thing here is that there are some climate related indicators that have been included in this overall assessment. Um, they are, um, there are in total only four standardized indicators. So it's the, the progress monitoring is limited and it's covering different aspects. And out of the 14, there are three that are mitigation related and there's an adaptation one. So four out of uh, 14 are climate and, and the climate ones are looking at a new in, in renewable energy capacity installed. So they're looking at um, um, energy efficiency and then they're looking at uh, clean transport uh, infrastructure. And I think the that last one, for example, is one that I think goes in the right direction of also checking, uh, including um, um, uh, an indicator about financing and financing going to the things that will actually structurally change the way that a sector operates. So that on your, and, and very briefly on the NECPs, I think uh, just to say that the reporting from member states to the NECPs, even if it only happens every two years, I think it's it's very important uh, to have that. It's basically the only real like um, mandatory feedback loop that we have on how member states are implementing these plans. And even just having the obligation to report on it and therefore create some transparency about implementation uh, you know, is important. The commission doesn't have a lot of means to act on the information though. You know, it's again, the old problem of you have info, but what are you doing with it? So the commission will um, produce an assessment by uh, I think October of 2023, based on the reports that should be in by March of 2023 for the first time. And then the commission will have a an, an, uh, report that is country specific and where the commission assessment shows problems, they will issue uh, recommendations. And, you know, member states are obliged to at least respond to the obligation. So, you know, this is basically the soft governance system that we have there. Um, and I, I think it's important that we have that, even though we don't know yet whether it's really going to be effective in terms of Im, um, improving policy on that, on that basis, as was already mentioned. Okay, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Chesson, uh, based on your experience uh, by uh, providing several funds to uh, Im improve energy efficiency, to reduce uh, climate change, uh, we see that lack of uh, climate-related indicators is actually one of the major problems why different uh, uh, d different types of funding is not successful because actually at the beginning because the monitoring was not set up and uh, this is actually the reason why also the implementation cannot be uh, understood as, as uh, something that needs to be measured in, in, in the level of impact. Yeah, unfortunately this is quite a burning issue in Slovenia um, that uh, when we set up certain measures, for instance, financial measures that include subsidies for different, I don't know, borders on renewable energy or something like that, 
that we do not set up a system how we will gather data and what the data will we, will we gather so that basically at the end um, no data is available not just for monitoring um, um, but also I don't know no statistics um, are available so that that cannot be included in the st statistics um, and that is why um, it is really important to stress um, as was mentioned as was shown in Mentimeter that the monitoring system is basically set up when the strategic documents are set up and also when the implementing measures are prepared um, and I think that it is really important that different institutions that gather data are also included when the preparation of certain policies and measures is done um, I think that here we still have to learn something from other countries um, but on the other hand I think that uh, we, sh we should be aware that there is also very difficult to separate what is um, the effect of certain instruments um, because different instruments can affect on the same on the same thing like um, to have higher levels of installation of houses you have different instruments in place and how to basically assess what is the effect of different instruments this is I think really a diff difficult task to do and it is really um, hard to assess what I don't know instrument is not delivering to reach the required installation levels um, I think that these are really tough questions that we are facing when monitoring okay thank you uh, since we are approaching uh, to the end of today's session I would like uh, to ask each of you uh, members of the round table for your final thoughts on uh, the title which we had for this uh, round table how to enhance the use of monitoring results for climate governments maybe one two three uh, bullet points uh, where you see the most uh, uh, where, where, where the most uh, improvement should be made maybe starting with uh, mr duve thank you uh, well i'm based on the analysis that we have done i think there are a couple of good practice points that i think are worth considering for those countries where they're currently not in place and uh, you know the first one of these is that uh, you know you can you know having a regular dedicated report on an annual basis about progress that isn't just sent off to the EU level, but as basically the subject of some discussion um, at the national level. I think that is, uh, you know, a way um, to enhance your policy making, and uh, you know, you can enhance the credibility of that uh, report if you're creating an independent scientific advisory council that actually does that job, um, and therefore can be seen to the results of the the exercise can be seen to be independent of government so it's not government trying to show that it's you know uh, doing good work but as an independent assessment that has more credibility um, and then the countries that i think do this uh, most seriously they actually oblige the government to respond to that report so that you know there's really there is a mandatory exchange here is the information what do you say uh, you know here is our response um, and then you need to have a trigger for something to happen on that basis. You know, discussion is one thing, but um, you know you can generate accountability for a potential lack of progress on the basis of that public discussion. But um, if uh, you have a legal framework for it, you can basically put into it that the government then needs to respond in some form with additional policy. You know, it's a relatively commonsensical thing to do, but actually putting that down as the rule for this is how we will uh, conduct our climate policy making is not common practice in all member states right now and i think that would be that will be an improvement and if i may add on top of that i think as i said and i want to stress that again um, it links also back to our last uh, exchange in the in the panel you know we do need um, to have now information from the eu level on you know, what's in the reporting template uh, for the NECPs? Uh, what will the progress measurement for climate neutrality look like? 
And um, what I would postulate is that we are best served if the commission actually establishes an open, transparent and comprehensive in terms of inclusive process for developing such a methodology. I think if this is only basically done by, you know, um, you know, by the way, here we are publishing our impact assessment, or by the way, you know, here is the draft for our templates. Um, what do you say, member states? I, I think that's not good enough in terms of how important it is to have, uh, you know, a, um, a solid harmonized system um, of, of indicators that can be used for reporting and assessment, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Mr. Chesson. Well, I would say, first of all, to set up a national system, um, to have it in, in law um, somehow. Uh, secondly, to improve cooperation between ministries, that not only Ministry for Environment is um, doing this and is um, really um, trying about this. Um, third, to improve data availability um, so that um, data is available um, for monitoring all the policies and measures. And the last, um, implementation of recommendations that come from the monitoring process and evaluation process. This would be my point. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Ferdong? Okay, I've uh, li little to add uh, to all the good points already put forward. Uh, I totally agree with them. Um, uh, th th this, this national framework or, or, or legal uh, framework for, for climate mitigation also helps to, um, to, to make monitor the, the, the life of monitors, uh, monitoring uh, more easy. Um, that that not, all, not only the Minister of, of Environment or Climate, uh, feels responsibility to monitor uh, impacts on, on climate, but also the Ministry of Economic Affairs or Agriculture, Transport, and having a national um, uh, target uh, that makes, makes all ministers uh, responsible, or at least have to contrib contribute uh, to that. And uh, if, if that is the case, then it's, uh, it really helps also for um, setting up a monitoring system which is broader than climate policies only, uh, but also for transport and agriculture. And a practical, uh, yeah, for practical a, a suggestion would be to, uh, I mentioned it earlier, to involve the implementing agencies um, in in setting up this 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 monitoring system, um, which enables uh, not only to monitor the implementation of the policy itself, but also gathers data on 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 activity levels, uh, techn technology, um, um, fuel consumption, etc. To yeah, but to make use of that data for more, uh, yeah, for, for, for making impacts, uh, calculating impacts. So, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fadong. Uh, with this, I would uh, like to conclude uh, today's session. Uh, thank you all uh, the presenters and uh, participants to the round table for your answers to sometimes uh, quite a difficult questions which are ahead of us, but uh, we are facing uh, so severe climate goals that nobody is really sure how we can achieve them and we'll have to work really on every possible solution and we'll have to be really careful how to approach uh, to the modeling in order to be able to uh, implement what we will somehow define in our strategies. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the participants of today's event. Uh, we have uh, tomorrow the second day uh, of the conference with the session on challenges of carbon neutral pathways uh, modeling and analysis. And we'll have uh, two sections, one about carbon neutral energy supply and the integration of sectors and the decarbonization of industry. You are uh, cordially invited uh, to the uh, event tomorrow uh, and also on Friday. 
If you have not received uh, the link uh, to participate at tomorrow's event, maybe you have not signed up for the second day, but you would like to join us, uh, please do write us uh, on the email, which is uh, in the chat section, climatepath2050 at ijs.si, and we will send the link uh, for tomorrow. Uh, again, thank you very much all for participating, and uh, we will start tomorrow at 9 o'clock with the conference. Uh, on uh, climate pathways. And uh, Matthias, you uh, asked for the uh, word. I, I actually didn't mean to. I was looking for an opportunity to join the clapping that would happen in the room itself. I, I just want to say congratulations already on the event and all of the work done under the project. And I hope that you get to continue doing that work because long-term climate planning isn't a one-off exercise. You know, it has to be a continuous process because, you know, we'll, we've still got a way to go towards 2050. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, again, uh, thank all of the participants. Uh, we'll see each other tomorrow morning at uh, nine. We start at nine o'clock.